Welcome back to a third day of the seminar on the World War I organized by UNICEF. As in our last two days, today we also have an excellent speakers and topics that will make relive history again. Today we also follow our schedule as was done on the first and the second day. And remember that at the end of each presentation, we will have the space for question. All questions, please, please, and ask in the chat or in the question of the section and as well. So now let's start our seminar. Let's to continue our next speaker, Craig Tibbets. Craig has worked at the Memorial since 2000, initially in the research center, where he has he was a senior a senior curator of the official private records. During most of that time, he also in share of the administration and research of the memorial roles of the owner. Craig has studied the management of the information, records, libraries, and archives at the University of Canberra in 1919. So let's welcome Craig Tibbets. Craig, it's so good to have you here today again. And thank you so thank much you. for joining us. The audience is all yours to begin your presentation. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Laura, and thanks, David. Um, you can still see my slide is uh, working okay? Yeah, it's okay. It's perfect. Good. Good. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk today about um, uh, First World War tanks and uh, the Australians, the Australian soldiers of the Australian Imperial Force, uh, their deployment uh, alongside tanks during the First World War. Uh, I'll just talk first a little bit uh, about yeah, our experience of fighting alongside armour in the First World War. And just a little bit um, to start with um, the development of tanks um, in the First World War for the British. So obviously there was, there was lots of ideas going back centuries for a variety of armoured vehicles that could protect occupants from enemy fire and, and have some sort of offensive weapon. Um, the idea in the First World War uh, was really once uh, trench warfare set in pretty early in the war at the end of 1914. Uh, the idea was to try and break the stalemate of trench warfare on the Western Front. Uh, the, the idea that what they wanted was to try and uh, manufacture some sort of vehicle that would be able to cross rough terrain, uh, shell holes, wire, uh, trenches, provide armoured protection, uh, for the occupants and mobile firepower. And the main challenge was really locomotion, how to drive the vehicle so it could, couldn't easily be stopped by enemy action and could cross that broken terrain, meaning it could do more than just stick to railway tracks or roads. Uh, so really, after many, many centuries of thinking of this sort of thing, um, the breakthrough was made possible by the internal combustion engine, which was applied to power vehicles in the 19th century. Uh, for example, in 1886, Carl Benz, the German, became the first commercial production of motor vehicles and internal combustion engine. Um, the British that first deployed proper fully tracked tanks that could uh, move cross-country were armed and combat capable. So this was uh, in early 1915, they established a landship committee, uh, committee uh, a small committee that was formed uh, during the First World War to develop such armoured fighting vehicles for the Western Front. And uh, the eventual outcome was what you see pictured there, which was a prototype which they nicknamed Little Willie. Uh, that tank that you see there uh, had many attributes that were good, but it was not large enough. So um, 
they had to make a larger version of that to be able to cross the terrain and particularly cross tr cross tanks. Uh, sorry, co cross trenches. They were codenamed tanks, really just uh, um, to try and fool the the enemy that the, what they were working on was not armed vehicles but just water tanks, really. And what it became uh, later in 1915 and then deployed in 1916 was the Mark I tank, uh, much larger as you can see there, and that uh, familiar shape and size there, um, which all the subsequent tanks uh, through towards the end of the war were were based on that. They started to get away from that design a little bit uh, by about 1918. So the Mark I tank was armed with either six pounder cannon or uh, machine guns depending on the, the type that they developed. There is actually also an Australian connection with the development of tanks. The man pictured there is Lancelot de Mole who's a Australian engineer. Uh, soldier and he came up with a prototype tank uh, using Caterpillar track which he sent to the uh, British War Ministry before the First World War in 1912. Um, there was an, an, another man in, in Austria whose name was Günther Bursten uh, who came up with a motor Geschütz which uh, again used a Caterpillar type track uh, armoured vehicle um, and he's actually had a gun on it um, but both those men, De Mol, the Australian, and uh, Burston, the Austrian, their designs were, were ignored. Uh, they were before the First World War, and there was no perceived need for them at the time. And, um, yeah, unfortunately, they didn't really get the credit for designing what probably could have been just as good, if not more effective, uh, tank designs as well. So the Mark I tank was designed by Lieutenant uh, W.G. Wilson and W.A. Tritton in 1915 and began production in 1916 uh, June and the first went into action in September uh, 1916. Uh, the French were also developing other tanks as well uh, around about the same time and they came into production a little bit later but I, w I won't go into any detail of that but that because that's got nothing really to do with the Australians. So um, the British uh, organised uh, what became a tank corps into a section of three tanks, then a company would be four sections, so that's 12 tanks, a battalion, three companies, it would be 36 tanks, and then a brigade of 144 tanks, which would be four battalions. Later in the war, those uh, formations got a, a, a bit larger as well. Um, as you see there on the slide, Mark II and Mark III came much uh, a, a little, little bit later, in uh, very early 1917. They were just training tanks, but they were uh, so they didn't have hardened steel armour, uh, which was a bit of an issue when I talk about the first battle the Australians were involved in at Bullecourt in early 1917. Um, an important development was the Mark IV tank, which was completed in 19, uh, March of 1917, and they first went into action at the Battle of Messines in June 1917. Um, and the better tanks started to come with the Mark V by the end of 1917. And again, um, they went into action uh, as the Mark IV did the, uh, the previous year with Australians and New Zealanders. The Mark V at the Battle of Hamel in early July 1918, that was a battle the Australians were involved in. Um, the Mark VI was just a larger version, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Just um, quickly, the tanks, uh, even though they're obviously very large steel beasts, um, they were not invulnerable at all. They they could certainly be knocked out. Um, the uh, the Germans quickly developed some anti-tank weapons and tactics as soon as the tanks appeared. Uh, they had armour-piercing uh, Kern or K rounds, which uh, with tungsten carbide core, and they were introduced in 1917. They could penetrate the armour of the tanks, uh, 12 millimetres at a range of 100 metres, sometimes more. So the British eventually increased the thickness of the tank's armour to counter these rounds. Um, 
the Germans then introduced a larger bore specialist anti-tank rifle which you see pictured there, the Tankgewehr M1918. Uh, that fired a 13.7 millimeter round and had much greater penetrating power than the other rounds that were fired by other rifles or particularly machine guns. So yeah, the the early tanks their their um, armor could be penetrated by uh, certain types of bullets. Artillery could also be very effective against British tanks. Uh, the standard German 77 millimeter field gun could easily knock out, as you see on the the right hand side there. That could knock out a tank, it could penetrate uh, the armour, uh, firing over open sites and using uh, special anti-tank rounds as well. Uh, the Germans also developed more specialised anti-tank artillery such as the Fahrpanzer or Panzer La Fette. Uh, it's an armoured uh, turret which you see pictured on the left there which could be actually moved on a gun carriage and positioned where they needed to on the battlefield and that uh, fired a um, a gun ranging from 37 up to 57 millimeter in calibre. They also improvised weapons such as infantry attacking tanks with grenades, trying to throw grenades into the tank, or uh, usually, or sometimes they'd bind together uh, a bunch of, of grenades and try and throw that tank inside. So it was important for tanks to have infantry protection as well. They also, uh, the Germans also developed anti-tank mines, which were a bit like improvised explosive design, uh, devices um, which were buried in the ground and they had a simple pressure plate on them so if a tank ran over them they could blow it, blow it up or at least disable and knock a track off um, and also they developed things such as ideas such as flooding the area to make it the, very difficult for the tanks to get through so getting on to the story of the, the Australian involvement when the the tanks first went into action on the Somme on the 15th of September 1916 at Flair Couslet. Um, uh, actually, was, uh, the Australians weren't involved in that, but the New Zealanders were. Um, this, the three tanks were supporting the New Zealanders, uh, but the tanks failed to reach the German line, so they had mixed success there. Um, so the Australians' first involvement would be at the Battle of Bullecourt, on uh, the 11th of April 1917. So the first Battle of Bullecourt took place in the snow as you can see pictured from that diorama there. Um, the plan was for the British and Australian infantry to capture a portion of the Hindenburg line either side of the uh, village of Bullecourt and then break through to the German rear. The Australian Force Division would be supported by 12 tanks. They would go ahead of the infantry and lead them forward onto their objectives. The plan was, uh, that they settled on was very dubious, uh, not a great plan at all. Uh, the tanks would concentrate and go forward to launch a surprise attack on the German positions uh, without any su artillery support. So they, they didn't have the normal artillery bar barrage that an infantry attack would normally have. Um, the idea was then the infantry would come forward and take the ground and the, the, the artillery would then belatedly open up in support. So to rely on tanks to play such a key role was very risky. At this stage there was plenty of evidence that tanks were highly unreliable and subject to breakdowns or getting stuck and they were very slow to come forward. The attack was scheduled for the early morning of the 10th of April but the tanks didn't arrive in time so they decided to try again the next morning the 11th of April. So on the 11th all but one of the tanks were ready in position uh, just after 3 a.m. But then when the operation was scheduled to start at 4.30 a.m., only three of the tanks had made it to the start line. So there was already problems developing. Um, the commander of the tanks, he said, my tanks were detailed to cooperate very closely with the infantry. Uh, the right section were given three duties to they were to parade up and down the German wire immediately in front of the uh, right in front of the attack and second to make uh, to remain with the infantry in the Hindenburg line until the trenches had been successfully blocked and the defensive flank secured and third to accompany the infantry in their advance on Rian Corps and, and Ender Corps. Uh, the centre section was uh, they were required to advance between the two infantry brigades and 
uh, plunge into the Hindenburg line. The two outermost tanks on both flanks of the infantry, once the enemy lines had been captured, were supposed to turn outwards then and then guard the Australian infantry uh, on their flanks. But these tanks didn't make it to where they were supposed to, uh, which was a problem because it left the Australian infantry, their flanks exposed. The artillery program was arranged to cover these extensive operations, but to enable the tanks to effect a surprise and operate ahead of the infantry, as I said before, there was no creeping barrage of artillery uh, to support them onto their objectives. Another problem that, that came was that, um, and this was something that they would, uh, a problem they would fix later on, was that uh, the Germans could easily hear the British tanks approaching, they could hear uh, their engines. Uh, so they had plenty of warning that there were tanks approaching. And another uh, bad mistake was that there would be a substantial gap between the two infantry brigades, uh, which is not a great idea. Um, and some of those tanks, as I mentioned before, were supposed to fill this gap. And the fact that they couldn't fill that gap made the Australians even more vulnerable to inter enemy counterattacks. So they had a gap between the brigades and they were also exposed on both sides. The Australians made some, made some mistakes too. Uh, there was some confusion with one brigade, the 12th, as to whether they should advance and even if the tanks didn't arrive on time to go ahead of them. Um, so that, and as I said, the tanks didn't arrive in time and, and the brigade didn't go forward. Uh, rather, they remained in place and ended up suffering more casualties from the German bombardment, which was now falling very heavily upon them. So ultimately, for the Australians, the tanks were largely ineffective. Uh, most of them broke down or failed to make it to the German wire. Just two reached the enemy lines. Ultimately, all, all but one were, were ditched or knocked out. Uh, it was reported that two tanks had cleared the Hindenburg line and were advancing further, but this turned out to be a false report. Um, the German 27th Division that was defending at Bullecourt reported that rifle and machine gun fire with armour-piercing ammunition could put the tanks out of action. Um, but on the 11th of April, most of them were put out of action by uh, field artillery, being hit by field artillery and a few by anti-tank guns. Um, and But some of the tank crew were, were also wounded or killed by uh, the armour-piercing uh, tungsten carbide bullets. There they, uh, the British deployed a mixture of Mark I and they also had some Mark II tanks. As I mentioned before, the Mark II and Mark III tanks were designed for training purposes and their armour was not hardened um, so that made them a lot more vulnerable um, and the crews were very exposed to um, uh, being wounded or killed. So yes, the, the Australian infantry ended up advancing into heavy machine gun fire and uh, rifle fire uh, had not been diminished or suppressed in the slightest by the tanks and within a short distance they encountered huge swathes of barbed wire along the attacking front which the tanks had not been able to crush and uh, allow the Australians through the barbed wire. The result was the Australian infantry which had gone forward. Um, they were able to capture the German trenches but they became cut off and quickly forced to fall back and retreat. And they suffered about 3,300 casualties uh, in total, the 4th Division, and that included about 1,000, oh, it was a little bit over 1,000 taken prisoner. Uh, the tank crew casualties at uh, the First Battle of Border Corps were 50%. Uh, Watson, the tank commander, said the attack was a failure and a minor disaster, although he didn't think it was necessarily his tank's fault, but the opinion of the Australians after this, uh, suffering such heavy casualties and seeing the tanks not perform the role they were supposed to, they felt that they, the tank support had been really quite useless. In fact, one said worse than useless. Uh, 
So yes, it was a disastrous start to Australians working alongside tanks. Uh, there's a few images there of British tanks knocked out at Bullecourt with German soldiers posing next to them. Next we move on to a little bit later um, in 1917 up in Flanders um, at the Battle of Scene. So after Bullecourt the, the Australians fought uh, alongside British tanks again um, in June 1917, 7th of June, uh, they went forward, tanks went forward in support of the Australian and New Zealanders when they attacked at Messine. Uh, there are several accounts in the official history of tanks and, and infantry working well together at that battle, so not, not so long after the disaster at Bullecourt. Uh, the tanks were especially useful in destroying enemy strong points and machine gun nests whenever they held up the Australian and New Zealand infantry advance. The next major engagement for the Australian infantry is at uh, the Third Battle of Ypres, uh, otherwise known as the Battle of Passchendaele, which went from uh, the end of July right through to November 1917. Tanks were used less in this battle at uh, Passchendaele. Um, especially especially when it was wet uh, because the terrain um, that they were operating in was very very boggy and they could um, get bogged in the, the morass there it became almost like a swamp when it, when it rained up at uh, Passchendaele and, the, and then when the tanks became bogged they could become easy targets for German anti-tank gunners there's just a couple more images there I'm showing of better conditions at Messine with Australians and New Zealand troops operating in conjunction with tanks. But this image here is typical of what happened with the tanks and a lot of, not all of the time was it uh, very wet and boggy at uh, Passchendaele but a lot of the time it was, uh, certainly from October uh, and November where they, even the tanks could just not get through. Um, the Australians uh, at Passchendaele, uh, their first battle of that campaign was at Menon Road in September. They didn't, they actually didn't want tank support. I think they were sort of influenced by the disaster at Bullecourt. Um, so they requested not to have any tank support. Um, they could see ahead of them on the field from the earlier battles in July that the, the, the field was littered with wrecked tanks and the terrain was just a massive shell craters. They did actually use just two tanks uh, which went forward with the infantry, but they were just used as mobile armoured um, wireless stations actually, not, not really as fighting tanks. Uh, and that was to assist with communications between the rear headquarters and the forward units. And the rest of the time that the Australians were fighting at Passchendaele in September, October and November, they didn't cooperate with the tanks at all, they, they just didn't use them. Um, as I said, from October onwards, it rained and rained and rained and the place just turned into a swamp. Uh, and the tanks were pretty much useless there. Later on in the year, um, the tanks had a, uh, a big part today and a big part to play in the Battle of Combray uh, in late November going into December, but the Australians weren't involved in that. That's where they deployed um, some 476 tanks um, which spearheaded a successful attack, but ultimately they ended up losing much of that ground to a German counter-attack. So moving into 1918, this is when the Australians started to have some success uh, working alongside tanks. Um, and the first was a, a relatively small battle uh, at a place called Hamel on the 4th of July 1918. Uh, it's a small village on the left bank of the Somme River, uh, about 20 kilometres east of Amiens. The aim in this battle was to clear a small German salient that bulged into the Allied lines. Uh, it was a useful place to capture from a defensive perspective as well as for future offensive purposes. Uh, originally, it was originally planned as a tank infantry operation. Uh, because of the experience of Bullecourt, the year before the Australians insisted that they 
this time would have a powerful creeping artillery barrage in support. Um, so that gave them a lot more confidence. Uh, they had plenty of experience working with artillery barrages and they trusted the, art the artillery. So at this stage, um, they still had some lingering doubts about working with the tanks. There were five Australian infantry uh, brigades and also several United States Army um, companies that were attached to them uh, went forward in this attack and they were supported by Australian Corps artillery and aircraft from the Royal Flying Corps and the Australian Flying Corps. This time they were supported by more tanks, uh, more than just 12, which they had at uh, Bullecourt, a total of 60 uh, the Mark V tanks. So these were better tanks than the ones that they'd worked with uh, the year before. Um, and in addition to those 60 Mark V tanks, they also had carrier tanks too, which would bring up supplies and ammunition. So the Mark V tank was a vast improvement on earlier models. It was uh, a little bit better armoured, um, faster, could certainly move a little bit faster and, and capable of moving, um, tur sorry, turning whilst moving. And also, importantly, it could be driven by just one man, the driver, uh, by himself. Much easier to handle. The important thing with the Battle of Hamel was before the battle, the... Um, British tanks and Australian infantry got to know each other. Uh, they trained and rehearsed extensively. Um, they rehearsed what they would do in the battle together and even the officers camped together, the Australian infantry and the British tank officers. They gained knowledge of how each other op operated and built trust in one another. Um, Lieutenant General Sir John Mon Monash um, said set piece manoeuvre exercises on the scale of battalion were designed and rehearsed over and over again. They used red flags, marked the enemy position, um, machine gun posts, real wire entanglements were laid out to show how easily the tanks could mow them down. Real trenches were dug for the tanks to leap and straddle and search with their fire. Real rifle grenades were fired by the infantry to indicate uh, to the tanks the enemy strong points. Uh, which were molesting and imp impeding their advance. And the tanks would throw themselves upon these places and pirouetting round and round would blot them out much as a man's heel would crush a scorpion. Another important development uh, for the Battle of Hermel was that the tanks were put under the command of the infantry. Um, that was something that the tank commanders were not all that comfortable with but it was insisted upon by uh, Monash and the other Australian leaders that they would be under the infantry command. Each infantry battalion was allotted, uh, allocated to a tank group, which was a section really of three tanks, and they advanced together cooperating uh, with tanks and their job was to deal with strong points uh, where enemy artillery or especially machine gun uh, positions were located. As Monash also said, uh, as I have on the slide there, the primary duty of the tanks is to save casualties to the Australian infantry. And this cannot be done so long as tanks remain in the rear of them. The tank commanders must do their utmost to get in between the infantry and the artillery barrage whenever possible. Uh, there's a picture there. Of one of the British tanks the day after the battle. The night before the, at Hamel, the tanks began moving forward to their positions, uh, guided by Australian infantry. Uh, early the next morning, they moved further forward to their jumping off points. Um, and the noise of this time, remember, uh, as I said before, at Bullecourt, the Germans could hear the tanks coming, so they were, they were alert and ready for them. This time, um, the noise of the tanks coming forward was covered by the opening of the artillery barrage, as well as noise from aircraft that was flying around uh, to mask the sound of the tanks coming. So when the attack commenced at 10 past three in the morning, uh, the artillery barrage lifted and began creeping forward 
The attackers followed in two waves, one infantry battalion with its complement of tanks, followed by another battalion of infantry with their tanks. And while mostly successful, not everything went to plan during the battle. In a couple of places during the attack, the tanks were running late, um, so the Australian infantry had to make their initial attacks without them, which is why it was a good idea to also have the artillery and machine gun support. Um, and so they were they were wise to anticipate that some tanks, for whatever reason, would not be in position in time. It was just something that happened. Uh, but mostly they were just running a little late, uh, not like Bulacor where um, many became stuck or broke down or knocked out and never got to the battlefield. At, at Hamel, ne nearly all of the tanks eventually made it forward and they were able to provide, provide very valuable help to the Australian infantry. The tanks at Hamel were very successful in dealing with enemy snipers and taking out enemy strong points, and they did this while the infantry were able to take cover which greatly reduced casualties. Sometimes the tanks would go forward firing machine guns and canister shot across the field, which would help flush out snipers. And on occasion, they would simply just run over and crush enemy machine gun posts. At one point, the Australian uh, 13th Battalion found a camouflaged enemy trench and there was a machine gun causing them casualties. A uh, tank was signaled to come forward and suppress it. And it did so, it came forward and just crushed the post uh, beneath its tracks, which allowed the infantry to come forward, capture the trench and, and take some prisoners. There was even one instance where a tank stopped near a German dugout and the commander, 2nd Lieutenant Edwards, and another tank crewman got out of the vehicle and attacked the enemy with pistols, killing seven and forcing the rest to surrender. The attack was very successful, with only limited objectives, uh, overwhelming strength and all arms cooperation, uh, so infantry, tanks, artillery, machine guns and aircraft, and all arms. Uh, all the objectives were taken and the attack was scheduled to be completed in 90 minutes and in fact it only took 93 minutes, so it was very well done. Four of the tanks, uh, as I mentioned, were carrier tanks, and they brought up am ammunition and supplies for the infantry, including uh, barbed wire, pickets, and, and water supplies, as well as ammunition. And this was very valuable because they actually, just those four tanks did the work that would normally take uh, more than a thousand men to do just by carrying it. Tanks also had an important role with the wounded and they would help evacuate the wounded to the rear for treatment. Uh, from the official history, uh, it says, as the attack would start in the early dawn, the infantry was apprehensive that the reserve and carrier tanks following behind the, the troops might crush the Australian and American wounded. So to avoid that, accordingly, each reserve tank was to be accompanied by three infantrymen. Uh, every uh, fighting tank would be guided by an Australian scout and every man in the attack carried a white tape to be, uh, to be tied on high crops or on a rifle stuck in the ground to mark the position of wounded men and returning tanks, including the carrier tanks, would help to bring back the wounded when possible. So at the Battle of Hamel, uh, Allied losses amounted to only 1,400 casualties, that's killed and wounded. Um, the Australian casualties were just over 1,000, including 800 dead. Uh, around 2,000 Germans were killed and 1,600 captured, and a lot of their equipment and uh, uh, machine guns, for example, were, were taken. Uh, only about five of the Allied tanks were damaged during the attack, but they were later um, repaired and they suffered only 13 killed and wounded amongst the British tank crew at Hamel. There's an image there of one of the British tanks disabled in the village of Hamel. It was later recovered. The next uh, major engagement, which saw the Australians again involved working alongside tanks, was the Battle of Amiens. 
There's a major offensive uh, commencing on the 8th of August and going for about a, a week. Um, it was on the British and French front along the River Somme. They used very similar tactics uh, as they had at Hamel uh, the previous month, but on just on a much, much larger scale. The, the, this time, the entire Australian Corps participated and they were fighting alongside a British Corps and a Canadian Corps. Um, this time they were supported by even more tanks. In total, there was over 500 tanks, including 432 fighting tanks. Um, as I mentioned before, there was, at Buller Corps there was only 12, at Hamel there were 60, so um, on the, the Australian portion of, of the front at the Battle of Amiens, they would have uh, almost 200 on, on the Australian front. So tanks um, for the first objective would move with the infantry on the fringe of a creeping barrage. So again, they had a good strong artillery barrage as well as the tanks. Um, fresh tanks uh, supported by all those that had survived the first stage would then lead the infantry onto the second objectives. And this in this stage, the tanks would go farther ahead of the infantry and try to suppress enemy positions, uh, which the infantry would then mop up and occupy. And then while the infantry was digging in on their second objectives, the tanks would patrol along the front, um, as was desired by the infantry commanders, and then they would be largely withdrawn. Um, then in the exploitation phase for the capture of the third object objective, uh, the only tanks participating would be the Mark V Star ones, which were actually the larger tanks which could carry a section of infantry or uh, a couple of machine gun crew, uh, almost really like an armoured personnel carrier as well as a tank. So um, the first wave of tanks had Australian infantry scouts alongside and just ahead of them and they would help identify German strong points for the tanks to uh, deal with. Uh, it was also good to have close infantry support to help protect the tanks from enemy infantry that might try and rush up to them and uh, you know throw grenades on them or inside them. Often if the infantry were engaged with a German strong point the arrival of a tank would quickly convince most of them to surrender. Uh, conditions that morning were made more difficult by thick fog. Um, sometimes this meant that the tanks ran into unseen ditches and became stuck. But when the fog cleared and visibility improved, it made it a lot easier for the tank crew to see the German strong points and machine gun nests. And they would usually make straight for them and look to knock them out or crush them as soon as possible. The official historian, the Australian official historian, Charles Bean, wrote, The terror created by the tanks emerged, emerging from the mist was most evident. Where the tanks appeared, most of the Germans were terrified. And it, as I mentioned, uh, often when tanks appeared, it would encourage the Germans to surrender. And this time, uh, they broke right through the German lines, and there were even opportunities to use smaller, what they called whippet tanks and armoured cars to exploit these breakthrough. These were faster vehicles and they did with, did so with some success, but probably not as much success as they could have. I, I don't think they really anticipated um, such a uh, emphatic breakthrough. Here we can see this slide here of um, Australian infantry at rest um, during the Battle of Amiens. Uh, with uh, at least one tank, I think there might be another one further back there, uh, in the background. So again, like at Hamel, they practice, They spend a lot of time practicing together. And this is how they deployed together. You can see the red dots there are really a line of infantry scouts. Um, the green there are the tanks and then um, in open order, the battalions of infantry following behind. Just some other images there. Um, 
The Battle of Amiens was a stunning success for the Allies. They broke through the German lines on a, on a wide front and advanced up to 11 kilometres on the first day. Um, the Germans suffered around 75,000 casualties and 30,000 captured. The Australians suffered 6,000 casualties in that first week, so that's from the 8th to the 14th of, of August. Just another couple of images from the Battle of Amiens. There's some uh, images there from that battle of those smaller, faster whippet tanks uh, that was designed to break through the lines and um, exploit success. Australians advancing there with a, a whippet tank uh, behind them. As you can see, they're advancing in small groups, in um, uh, you know, section size groups of about eight eight men, just in uh, column, what they call sort of worm column formation. That's that quote by Bean about the terror that was created by the, um, the tanks, particularly at the Battle of Amiens. An image there, that's a, an artwork by um, uh, Septimus Power. Um, another innovation was the use in 1918 of uh, dummy tanks, and this is something that would be used in the Second World War, notably at the Battle of El Alamein too, where two um, full German observers in either balloons or aircraft, they would uh, station, they, they'd build these tanks uh, out of dummy tanks out of uh, canvas and wood and position them in parts of the battlefield to fool the Germans to think that's where tanks were concentrating for an attack whereas they were concentrating elsewhere they could just be lifted quite easily as you can see and then positioned on the battlefield to um, do that so um, after the Battle of Amiens, heading into the final phase of the war, tanks also assisted the Australians and when the Americans were working with them as well uh, during their advances uh, to up to and beyond the Hindenburg Line late in the war. Um, and by this time, the Australians had built up considerable experience working with tanks and they were comfortable operating alongside them and appreciated the help that they could bring. Um, this was especially valuable in reducing Australian infantry casualties because by the final months of the war Australian infantry battalions were very very weak in numbers uh, because uh, as you probably understand the Australians were all volunteer force so they relied on uh, volunteers to fill the ranks of, uh, uh, as they suffered casualties and the volunteer numbers were very, really dwindling badly by 1917 especially into 1918 um, instead of a thousand men in an infantry battalion, uh, late in the war the Australians were sometimes going into action with only 250 to 300 men in a battalion. So any the assistance that the tanks gave them um, in achieving their objectives and reducing casualties was, was an important factor for the Australians. Just an image there of onwards to victory, uh, tanks moving forward at Bellicor late in the war. Uh, I might just mention, um, before we go into questions, uh, the after, in the aftermath of the First World War, um, the Australian Tank Corps was authorised in December 1927 and created in 1928 and they got their first tanks which were for Vickers Armstrong Mark II tanks uh, in 1929, and they were later replaced by Mark VI Vickers tanks. So it was a few years after the war that we established our own tank corps. Uh, this is obviously peacetime, so we only had a very tiny tank corps with only a handful of tanks. Uh, until the Second World War, when we created the Royal Australian Armoured Corps uh, in 1941, and Australians did operate 
tanks in the Second World War. We created tank divisions, uh, brigades, and also cavalry regiments, which operated tanks. Uh, most of our tank forces operated, uh, they remained in Australia for home defence, uh, but some, some of the smaller formations deployed overseas and fought with, it, uh, with the Australian infantry in North Africa. For example, they were at the Battle of El Alamein and in the Southwest Pacific, places such as Papua, New Guinea, Borneo and Bougainville. Uh, in the Second World War, we used a variety of tanks, including Crusaders, Matildas, Grants and Stuarts. Um, Australia did actually also design and build its own tank during the Second World War, which was called the Sentinel, uh, but that none of those ever actually saw action. So I think uh, that's where I can finish up, and we can move on to the questions if you if you like. Thank you, thank you very much for this amazing presentation. I think it was really interesting topic and inspired for everyone. Thank you very much, Craig. Thank you. You're welcome. And so during the presentation, we received several questions in the chat from the audience. So we are from different countries. I will try, and will try to answer one of them. I just like to hand over to David to get you start with some questions from the public. So David, ¿qué te parece si iniciamos con nuestra ronda de preguntas? Sí, eh, tenemos varias preguntas que nos han enviado los alumnos eh, en relación a la siguiente ponencia de la primera de ellas sería la siguiente en otros frentes de batalla se tiene constancia de que las fuerzas australianas como por ejemplo en Oriente Medio podían utilizar tanques o vehículos blindados adscritos a sus unidades ok the first question that we have right now is about the the Australian ANZAC forces did not have any tanks during the war, but is there any records of the Australian troops fighting alongside British tanks during the fighting of the Western Front? Yep, yep, um, definitely uh, not, not in the beginning when the tanks were first deployed, as I, I mentioned in the presentation, um, but they did operate alongside British tanks on the Western Front on a few occasions, uh, notably at the Battle of Bulacore in uh, April 1917, which went very, very badly. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, the tanks had a bad reputation. The, the Australians didn't like working alongside tanks because that battle went so badly. Um, they had experience fighting alongside them at the Battle of Messines in uh, Belgium and Flanders um, and that went a lot better though the tanks were able to show the Australian infantry that they could actually be helpful uh, when they were going forward to attack uh, particularly taking out enemy strong points uh, machine gun nests and that sort of thing and also mainly helping to reduce their casualties because if a tank could go forward and knock out an enemy machine gun positions uh, while the infantry were able to stay in relative cover, that was a good thing. So, um, as I mentioned, there was very little opportunity to work with the tanks at um, Ypres in uh, Belgium, the Battle of Passchendaele, because the tanks couldn't operate in such muddy conditions. Um, but then in 1918, those battles that I um, focused on earlier, like the Battle of Hamel in July 1918, Amiens in August 1918, and then the Hindenburg Line, September going into October 1918, they had, the tactics were much better and they had success, the Australian Infantry had success working with the tanks. Uh, they trained together, they practiced together, they got to know each other, and they were a lot more organised uh, with working and operating together to really complement each other. And again, the Australians really uh, benefited in being able to achieve their objectives with the help of tanks, and the tanks helped to reduce their casualties as well. Thank you, Craig. Excellent as well. Thank you, Craig. Tenemos una, una segunda pregunta. 
que dice así, eh, los primeros tanques australianos fueron carros de combate británicos, medianos y ligeros, que fueron operados principalmente con fines de entrenamiento durante las décadas de 1920 y 1930. ¿A qué es debido que Australia no utilizara los tanques en la Primera Guerra Mundial como otras naciones belicantes? Ok, the, the other question that we have is about the first Australian tanks were British medium and line tanks that were operated mainly for training purposes during 1920s and 1930s. Why did Australia not use tanks in the World War I like other belligerent nations? Yeah, it's a, a, a good question. Um, I've not really come across any definitive information as to whether the Australians were ever uh, uh, had ideas themselves that they would like to uh, form tank formations or the, the, I don't think they were ever asked to form tank formations. I think really um, the main reason I suspect is that the Australian uh, Australians had five divisions of infantry and as I mentioned before uh, they were all volunteer force they didn't rely on conscription um, and really by the end of 1916 it was becoming apparent that there were not enough reinforcements to keep the Australian infantry um, units up to full strength and that became even worse in 1917 and then worse again in 1918 So I think really there would have been resistance to sending Australian men to um, serve in the tank corps or to operate their own tank units because they just didn't have enough men to to <laughs> provide reinforcements for the, to keep the infantry units up to strength. I think that's the main reason really. And I suppose it, it may also, they might have also been prejudiced against the tanks from their early uh, negative experience uh, where things didn't go very well at the Battle of Bulacore in April 1917. So I, th I think that's, um, that's why th that was the situation. Thank you, Greg. Y tenemos una tercera pregunta, Laura, eh, que dice así. Eh, ¿Podemos considerar que el ejército australiano tuvo malas experiencias operando con los tanques británicos durante las primeras etapas de su empleo durante la Gran Guerra? Ok, the other question that we have is about, about uh, can we consider that the, that the Australian army had bad experience operating with British tanks during the early stage or their employment during the Great War? Yeah, definitely. Um... Yeah, the the, bat, the battle at uh, Bulacore was uh, the first experience of the Australians working alongside tanks, and it was really pretty much a, a disaster, which it, which affected the Australians. Um, they didn't forget that for a while, and it took them quite a while to get used to working with tanks and learning to trust what they could do to help them. I mean, the battle at Bulacore was just very very hastily planned they threw the plan together very quickly and it was ill considered um, to try and attempt to do what they did without proper artillery support and also there was plenty of evidence at the time that you know the tanks at that stage were very unreliable um, they had a lot of problems with uh, easily stuck or ditched uh, lose direction Uh, they was you know the tanks were still figuring out how to uh, the tank crew was st still figuring out how to try and fight in the tanks at the time. Um, they suffered casualties too. You know, as I said, some of those tanks at Bulacore were not should not have been used because they didn't have hardened steel uh, armored plates at all. So the tank crew suffered terrible casualties. So they, I mean, they were, the tank crew were very very brave in trying to attempt. Um, to do what they did, but it was poor equipment, poor planning, poor execution, um, which led to that disaster. So, yeah, um, that was really the first time and, and really the only time that was 
turned out to be a disaster. But as I mentioned, in particularly in 1918, uh, once they had better tanks, more experienced tank crew, and they'd figured out better tactics and how to work with the infantry and also artillery and, as I mentioned, the combined arms approach, uh, all organised and working together, then the, the Australian infantry grew to uh, appreciate that the tanks were really worthwhile support in going forward and to, to attacks. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Uh -huh. So, vamos con una última pregunta para continuar con la programación de hoy. Sí, esta última pregunta que nos envía este alumno es la siguiente. En la final de la Primera Guerra Mundial, ¿cuál fue la estrategia del ejército australiano para equipar y mecanizar su caballería? ¿Cómo se realizó la mecanización de las unidades de caballería australiana desde la adquisición de sus primeros tanques en 1920? Okay, the last question is about after the end of the World War One. What was the Australian Army's strategy to equip the mechanized its cavalry? And how was the mechanization of the Australian cavalry units carried out since the accusation of its first tanks of 1920? Okay, yeah. Um, uh, the Australian Tank Corps was uh, created in 1927, 1928. And um, they had the four, I think I mentioned before, the four Vickers Armstrong tanks. Um, and so the first Australian armoured unit was called the first tank section uh, as part of the Australian Army Militia. And during the 1930s, there was a lot of economic difficulties with the Great Depression and nobody wanted to spend much money on, on, uh, on war materials. Um, there was only a very small cadre of uh, the regular tank personnel maintained for instructional purposes. Um, although by later in the decade, uh, the economic situation had improved sufficiently to, uh, to allow the expansion of the first tank section into a first into the first light tank company, um, and then they later expanded that to to a, a second light tank company, and they replaced those Vickers. Mark twos with Mark threes. Um, in the Second World War, they ended up uh, expanding armoured forces to we, uh, four divisions of uh, each of the four divisions of the Second Imperial Force, Australian Imperial Force. Um, they raised cavalry reconnaissance regiments, and they were equipped with light tanks and uh, scout carriers, um, and they operated in the Mediterranean, North Africa against German and Italian forces, um, much the same as uh, using British equipment as well. Um, as I mentioned before, they created the Australian Armoured Corps in 1941, and uh, we created several divisions, brigades, and um, some of the cavalry regiments as well. Um, for example, the Battle of El Alamein, um, the Ninth Cavalry Regiment uh, participated in the, the closing stage of that, um, and also in um, the Southwest Pacific. So, um, yeah, they developed it quite uh, significantly in the Second World War. Um, the tanks, not quite to the extent of uh, operating um, like the British did with uh, full armoured regiments going into, or armoured divisions going into action against the, the Germans. Um, the New Zealanders were a bit different. They um, stayed with the 8th Army in the Second World War after El Alamein and fought through the rest of the North African campaign and then into Italy. And they ended up converting one of their um, infantry uh, brigades into a tank brigade. So effectively it became like a, a motorised armoured division. Um, there was one other thing I should have mentioned uh, in the First World War. There was, um, we, we did also have some armoured car units, which they operated in uh, the Middle East, in uh, Egypt and Sudan, and also Sinai, Palestine. 
Um, so that was, you know, they're not tanks, but they were sort of, yeah, as I said, armoured car. So uh, armoured car units, there was a, uh, one Australian unit that operated there. And the other thing I should have mentioned too was that uh, there was one Australia, uh, Australian tank crew that was trained to operate a Mark IV tank. Now they were trained not to uh, go into battle and fight on the Western Front. They were, um, they, during the war they brought a Mark IV tank back to Australia and these Australian uh, crew, uh, they were trained to operate it so they could drive it around and it was for the purposes of exhibition um, to show, demonstrate to the public what tanks looked like and what they could do and for the purpose of raising funds through war bonds. So there was there was actually just one uh, crew of Australians that uh, learned how to operate a tank during the First World War. Thank you, Craig. Thank you for your answer. And thank you very much for providing, so, providing such a great presentation to all our audience. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. So I would like to give the floor to David to give a brief summary that was uh, what was seen in the presentation right now. David, ¿qué te parece si iniciamos con ese breve resumen de lo que vimos en esta ponencia? Eh, perfectamente. Eh, ante todo, Laura, pues quería agradecer al doctor Craig Tibbitt eh, de los Science War Memorial su participación en este seminario sobre la Primera Guerra Mundial y sobre todo felicitarle por su magnífica ponencia sobre tanques en la Primera Guerra Mundial, la experiencia italiana de combatir junto a los tanques blindados eh, británicos. Eh, el profesor Craig Tibbitt nos ha ilustrado con un detallado análisis histórico sobre la participación de Australia en la guerra y en concreto la experiencia de esas tropas australianas combatiendo junto a las unidades blindadas británicas. También nos ha descrito la utilización en las diversas unidades de tanques utilizadas en Copa. Recordemos que fue en 1916, eh, los paros de combate hicieron su terrible aparición en el campo de batalla por primera vez en la historia, por un ejército que recurrió a ellos para combatir a muerte. El primer tanque de guerra de la historia fue el Mark I, como lo he estado detallando y explicando el profesor eh, Kai Tibit. Lo desarrolló el ejército británico, era capaz de cruzar trincheras, resistir disparos de armas ligeras, viajar a través de terreno difícil transportar pertrechos y sobre todo capturar posiciones enemigas muy bien fortificadas. El Mark I, como nos ha estado detallando el profesor eh, Tibitz, resultó un derivado del Little Willy, el vehículo experimental que construyeron tanto el teniente Walter G. Wilson como William Triton para el Landship Committee en el verano de 1915. Y hasta aquí este pequeño resumen de la excelente ponencia que nos ha realizado el profesor eh, Tibitz de la Australia en Dual Memorial. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Jake. Thank you. Let's introduce our speaker, Captain Arthur, graduate from the University of New Brunswick with a master's degree in history in 2005. In 2013, Captain Galinzi was the select for the postgraduate training list, again accept into the PhD program in history and the Western Union in London, Ontario. Graduated in 2016, uh, he was then posted as a military faculty to the Royal Military College of Canada a second world war specialist. So let's welcome Captain Arthur. It's so good to have you here today again. And thank you so much for joining us in this event. And the audience is all yours to begin this interesting topic that took place in 1916. And there you go. Can you, I'll just try a couple of uh, slides back and forth. I, that, that working on your side? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, okay, <laughs> excellent. Well, very, very nice to see everyone here today. I'm uh, Arthur Glaxon, as, as was stated. Um, uh, my um, presentation today is on the Psalm 1916. And it's very much a battle of attrition. That's the title of the, the talk today. So I'll go on to the next slide here. So uh, trenches at this time in the First World War, two years in, they bisected France right from the channel, right to the border of Switzerland. The Psalm was one of the most largest attritional battles of World War II, where, where both sides were battering away at each other. This battle has made very much an imprint on the British psyche as a, as a terrible, terrible event. Uh, it saw a shift in British strategy from a sea strategy, such as their invasion, amphibious invasion of the Dardanelles, to a land strategy, 
um, with their main efforts taking place in Belgium and France um, as their strategic focus, uh, some, you know, to, to have it in France. And this attack, it was very much an attempt, an Anglo-French attempt to draw away German troops for Verdun, where the German and French were engaged in a desperate struggle. One of also of attrition, where the Germans sought to breed the French forces white, bleed them white. Um, the Somme was a tremendous effort for relatively little gains um, by today's standards. It's almost in a, in a terrible way, it's very similar to the fighting in Ukraine that we see on the news stations today. You know, slowly but surely, uh, you know, grinding battles taking place. So, the, looking at an overview of the battle, the aim was to break through using uh, the French and British armies of, uh, of um, uh, the British Expeditionary Force and the French Regular Army, as well as lots of Imperial forces from uh, the British, uh, these being Australian, New Zealand, Canadian. Uh, the French Sixth Army was to play a, a major role in some victories that are largely somewhat forgotten in the Anglo and Anglo geography of the battle. Troops that took place, there's some of the fittest, most educated, enthusiastic British and Dominion volunteers, the pride of the empire. And these terribly, some of these soldiers were machine gunned and shelled to death in the thousands. And then you see the two main allied protagonists there on this slide. Uh, this is uh, French General Joseph Joffre on the left and British Expeditionary Force General, the brand new commander the taking over from uh, Sir John French, uh, General Douglas Haig, where they're the main protagonists behind this Anglo-French attack. So this new British Army of 1916, the year 1916, this is the second British Army of World War I. It's formed from volunteers uh, who volunteered from 1914, 1915. And after their training, they are destined to go into action en masse in uh, the Battle of the Somme. The driving force was Herbert Kitchener, uh, UK Secretary of State for War, who would later die in a, uh, the sinking of the cruiser he was on as he's going to Russia. You see him on the, the poster there. And Kitchener's plan was this army, this new army, would be ready to put into action in 1917. But circumstances dictated its use a little bit before then. And, of course, the British you see in the center poster, the, that recruiting poster, um, bantams. That's, of course, the, the term for small small um, uh, roosters or chickens. And, of course, being applied to human beings there, men. West of England, bantams, applied to the recruiting office. They were taking any and everybody for this upcoming new army they are creating. So, I have an overview of the campaign. It's, and you see the Battle of Somme. People always say that the Battle of the Somme, but it's, it's very much a lengthy a trip campaign. On the 1st of July, 1916, both the British Fourth Army and the French Army attack and make some gains uh, to the east, but at a huge cost. Um, they tr fail tremendously, the British do, in the northern part of their, their attack sector. Uh, the French attack from the, the towns of, hopefully not slaughter some of the pronunciations here, Pocot en Saint-Pierre, south of the Somme, to Maricourt, to on the north bank of the Somme River, and then the British on the north side of the Somme advanced from Maricourt to the vicinity of the Albert Beaupalm Road, the main sort of northeast uh, road, uh, if you look at the map. After these advances, the battle took on a grinding nature that went on for months. It goes on for months. Uh, with Allied attacks and counterattacks, a series of efforts had to be made to capture villages that had been literally wiped off the face of the earth, erased. Um, but in November, the British and French had penetrated roughly 10 kilometers, um, and a little more, a little bit less in some places. But these were the biggest gains to the Allied armies, the Entente powers, uh, since the Battle of the Marne in 1914. And the oper operational goals of the French and British were largely unfulfilled. Um, beats occur today about the aspect of the battle, its significance, and the true cost to all armies involved. In 1917, a series of withdrawals away from this battlefield would be undertaken by the Germans to pull back to the, the conquer bunkers and defenses of the Hindenburg line to the east. So you check out some color shots there. Uh, Pre-World War I shot, Thepeval Chateau, is the monument on uh, the Thepeval High feature, as well as an aerial shot of the trenches there. 
the, the train and weather, the 1st of July, 1916, is beautiful, beautiful French weather, as you might see in, in, in Paris or, you know, as Northeast France um, in July of this year. Both sides were deep trench with trenches and obsession of key train features on both sides, such as Tep Val, which you see it there, here with the monument today. But this was a rather small area by North South American standards today. You know, if you're driving fairly fast in a, you know, as a rally car driver or something like that, you could get around it in about an hour's time doing a circle around the whole battlefield. Now, why could the Allies, you know, with all their massive forces, why couldn't they just break through the defenses? By 1915, the power of the defense had, had uh, stopped over warfare. And we see the end of the decisive circling battle where the two sides are maneuvering around the battlefield, automatic machine gun fire, limb movement by both friendly and infantry. The artillery is very much better. You know, its, it's accuracy is enhanced through aerial observation through the very primitive aircraft. And, but controlling the battle, understanding its progress as a command is very, very difficult. Cavalry and the very primitive tanks, these are hard, hard to use. And of course, it's if you're a cavalryman, you can't charge against a machine gun or ride your horse through a of shell holes and trenches. Signals and command, it's also very difficult, as well as basic communication. For any attack to work, preparation had to take place. At the same time, the defender was also very, very well prepared. So, brings us to German defense of Dutch in the year 1916. It's laid out by the, the gentleman you see here on the right, uh, the, 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 chief, the German general staff, von Falkenhayn, he's, he's the, the general German staff, the German word for it. He opened Heer's Leitung, the OHL, and his mantra for defending was not to step back, fight the last man for the forward line. If any land is lost, there's to be an immediate counterattack with the troops that are left alive. And the enemy, enemy if it was to advance to German lines, it would literally have to advance through German corpses. And, you know, you can imagine how popular those words were with the front battalion commanders. Germans, however, they lose the majority of their men due to artillery directed at their front-line trenches were very strongly held due to doctrine that he's enforced that not a inch back, you know, not a, not a foot of, uh, or a meter of ground will be lost. You see the German soldiers, that's how they looked in 1916 on the left. So, so tunneling and aerial observation and the first fighter aircraft employed this this um, in the year 1960. Tunneling and mining were very much in vogue, but you know the mining it would decline from this point in the war to the end of the war in 1918. Um, new aircraft such as the British DH-2 and FE-2B were available in numbers to attempt to gain air security accurately spot for the artillery and conduct observation of units. And these uh, and, and tunnels, as you see there, um, they would, of course, be, be filled in with uh, explosives to, to get under the German front lines and to hopefully allow your infantry soldier to charge forward after this huge explosion had taken place. So there's one of those uh, mines getting exploded there on the first day of the Somme. You see the, the giant explosion. And so tactical developments to help the infantry advance, which was very, very difficult in 1916. Mines were dug under the front line. These were with various results. Infantry tactics, though, were very poor. Nothing like today, uh, where you see an infantryman, I know he charges forward to, says, uh, up, excuse me, down. And, of course, up, you're jumping your feet, then me, that's the enemy machine gunner down. It is sort of the, the pepper potting that we see today in Anglophone armies. Um, that wasn't present in 1916. Too few of the new tanks, you see it in the little diagram there, the one of the first tanks advancing. But the commanders, they thought, well, we'll just bomb the living daylights out with huge bombardments of artillery that go on for weeks and you know, days. And they thought that would do the job. And there's also new artillery tactics, such as the creeping brush, which would fire on a line. Several guns would fire on a line of trenches. Then they'd stop and lift forward. And then they'd do another line that's, say, um, 20 meters or 30 meters ahead. And the intent was the, the British infantry or 
Allied infantry, the French Entente infantry, follow along with these artillery expeditions that would suppress the Germans until they get to the German positions. Too late for the Germans, they'd be suppressed and uh, allow them to advance. So they'd hide behind this, this moving artillery broad. Uh, now the Germans, but they, they had a plan for this. They would uh, wait in their deep shelters until the, the artillery fire stopped or passed over them, and then they charge out into their ruined ditches. But at the same time, at this point in the war, the German soldiers began to favor fighting from shell holes and craters, which they thought were less of a target for the artillery. Um, there's also wide of gas shells. There's sophisticated artillery shells with gas content in them. Chemical weapons, also aircraft, would attempt to influence the battle and fulfill the roles. But their role as ground attack craft, of course, in 1916 was very primitive. So why attack in the Somme? Why there? Uh, strategic developments of spring 1916. There's the Chantilly Conference in the, the photo there of all, all the suffered uh, very uh, primitive uh, automobiles for the generals. The British, the French, and the Italians all agreed to, to attack in the year 1916. And the Somme was the Franco-British part of this massive series of offensives. Now, this these plans get ruined um, in um, this, the first part of the year uh, as the Germans at Verdun from February 1916 to December 1916. That huge battle, attritional battle there against the French. Um, the, the French commanders had and some of their Somme attack forces south to deal with this German attack at Verdun. There's also the Bulov Offensive. The Russians have their one big success of the war um, between the 4th of June and 12th of September. The British really wanted to attack in August as part of their Anglo-French attack at the Somme and have all their forces assembled there and ready then. But uh, tragically for the French, the, the Battle of Verdun happens and they have to leave the British to become the main attack force uh, north of the Somme River. Well, the French will still attack, but not with as much of powerful forces. The chosen, of course, because that's where the British front and the French fronts meet uh, near or at the Somme River. So this huge buildup begins for the French and British forces uh, in the sect in the sector of the Somme between May and June 1916. They move a tremendous amount of infantry divisions, uh, engineering troops, artillery units, you know, uh, as well as cavalry divisions. Now, the, the British troops, they're a mixture. The pre-war army, left of it, the territorial force, which was like the National Guard in the United States today, and Kitchener's army, the force of wartime volunteers. Added as the battle passed, many Dominion formations were used as Australians, New Zealanders, and Canadians. A huge artillery bombardment starts about a week from the actual attack date to 1st of July, as well as underground mining efforts go into high gear, digging away and filling up these tunnels with explosives. The don't put in a large logistics effort with light rail because they feel they're, they're going to advance so quickly they'll leave behind any uh, railroad networks for logistics. And this is a bit of a mistake on their part. And, but while reversals for the British infantry to take place, their tactics are lacking, and the overloaded British troops are told to simply walk forward in the initial attacks with their headgear, food, ammunition, and other trenching tools, and then this will be disastrous. Um, but for the British commanders, the corps commanders, the divisional commanders, tremendous optimism, and they see this, this artillery barrage going on for nearly a week. They figure nothing can survive this. There's the British French commanders. You see them there, left to right. There's the British Fourth Army commander, General um, Rawlinson, later the Lord Rawlinson. Uh, the British Reserve Army commander in the center, General Gaul, uh, eventually would become uh, the commander of the Fifth British Army as the Reserve Army gets renamed. And, and to the south of the Somme are very long. Them, there's the Fayol General, the German or uh, French Army commander. Upwards of British divisions and 48 first divisions will see action over the period of July, August, September, October, November. It just goes on and on. And they'll, of course, be rotated through once they're fighting power or gasoline, they'll be replaced. Uh, the Germans, according to the whole show for uh, several armies uh, in the northern part of France, is uh, Crown Prince. You see him on the left there. He's the army group 
Army Group Ruprecht, Crown Prince Ruprecht. Um, and in the Somme sector initially is General von Bilo. See him on the right. He's the commander of Second Army. Then later on, he's uh, switched to a brand new army, and he's the first army commander. Uh, in the center, you see General Galwitz um, takes over as second army commander in Dubai, and also uh, oversees both the first and second armies. It's a very confusing arrangement as commander of a mini army group, Army Group Galwitz Dash Som. It's, it's, it's very complicated. Uh, the Germans would eventually get these two armies to control their defense battle. And they wrote also upwards of 50 divisions out of the line, into the line, out of the, into the line, you know, of course, to be drawn as they became weakened as the, the slaughter, and it was a slaughter, continues. Original plans for the attack, the losses had, had, had badly reduced the French team power. On the 16th of June, uh, the British Expeditionary Commander, General Sir Douglas Haig, finds the objective for the Brits, or the British Fourth Army, the relief of the French at Verdun, inflict losses on the Germans, and to do all this by uh, capturing roughly about 20 kilometers of German lines from Montauban to Sierre. The Third Army and the or British Third Army in the north will mount a diversionary attack at Gommacourt. And in the second phase, this is the second phase for the French and Anglo French, the Fourth Army will take the second German positions, Posiers to Ancre and south to the Palm Road, and then attack a German position to the east. Um, the British Reserve Army would attack with three cavalry divisions and exploit east to Arras. French would, to the south would guard the British flank, the British right flank, if you look at the map there, um, Somme River to Faucon Court. The British Corps commanders, as I said previously, they're very optimistic for the most part. They see these huge artillery strikes going on and on. Uh, they think, well, no, nothing could survive this. There is the case of the betrayal of British plans and French plans had crossed the lines and informed uh, the Germans of the upcoming offensive several weeks earlier. The Germans undertake heavy defensive works and move more reserves. Recent research within German archives illustrated that the Germans knew what was coming. But of course, any question was taken away when the Germans started uh, firing their artillery pieces or the British started firing their artillery pieces for a week, week and a half straight for the actual attack. See some British troops there uh, on the left, and there's a German machine gun crew, crew there on the right. The 1st of July, the attack actually goes in. Mines, artillery, and the, the advance of French and British infantry. 19 mines are set off. You see one of the, the huge craters of it, Buckner Crater, uh, is next to the, the German positions. Uh, there's also huge allied superiority. They had some some good effect, you know, exploding these mines. And they allowed for gains by the British infantry. Uh, some Germans were buried alive. Others, not so much. They managed to race out of their deep underground shelters and into the trenches and machine gun positions. Um, we see in the center photo there, British troops advancing near Mametz. And some use of gas is made but its results are limited. The Germans are very alert, and the winds don't exactly cooperate for the British. But the British are very confident, because you see there on the right in that photo, uh, a tremendous mountain of shells, as many shells they fired. And of course, there are like this all behind the British front line. So the first phase of the battle, from the 1st of July to the 3rd of July, on the southern front with the French and the British, there's really good results by World War I. On the northern front, it's very, very bad. This is known as the Battle of Albert, one of many sub-battles within the Battle of the Somme. Um, these are the first two weeks of combat. Um, and, you know, this period includes the, the infamous first day of the Somme when all the British infantry are slaughtered. The British and the French were very confident. Uh, the right wing of the British Army, Fourth Army, and the left wing of the French Army scored considerable victory. They take the, the German uh, front line positions, their first position, first series of trenches. Um, but from Albert Bopalm Road to Goncourt, it's an absolute, absolute disaster. There's 60,000 British casualties. The attack to the north is somewhat abandoned to reinforce the success to the south. And the success to the south, though, it's somewhat forgotten historically. Because everybody remembers the first day of the Somme, 
in which almost 19,000 British soldiers, officers, and men were killed among the 60,000 British casualties. Um, the severity of the events to the north is epitomized by the Newfoundland uh, Regiment at beaumont -Amel. It's one of many battalions that are very badly shot up. It's annihilated. But, and the German focus this time defensively, as per the, the direction of uh, General von Falkenstein, uh, is to hold the front to the last man, launch prompt counterattacks, and then prepare for an eventual counteroffensive. Von Falkenstein wants to shatter the British, destroy their attack, then do his own counteroffensive. Um, and to do this, when, when some of his uh, second army chief of staff had um, uh, proposed a withdrawal in the, in the light of this huge British attack, he replaces them. And they insert this Colonel Fritz von Losberg, a defensive specialist. And uh, 12th of July, the, the Germans actually stopped their attacks at Verdun in order to feed forces to the, to the north to fight on the Somme. The second sort of um, well, sub-battle is the Battle of Bazentin Ridge on the 14th to the 17th of July, 1916. The Fourth Army attacks the German positions um, um, the position from Guillemont to Givenchy and the ridge to Pozieres. The objectives were uh, the villages of Bazentin Le Petit, Bazentin La Grande, and Longueval. And there's individual battles for ridges and woods, such as Deville Wood. Four British divisions attack for this attack, but most of the objectives were captured, and the, and the German defenses were put under great pressure. Uh, but the success by the British was followed up due to miscommunication, casualties, and lack of organization following the, ca uh, the chaos combat. Today, with the phone communications and GPS and, uh, you know, sophisticated radios, none of that. There. Um, the Germans at this time, they begin to feed in reserves and many counterattacks occur. There will be almost a revolving door of German divisions in the song. As soon as they are fought out or weakened, they are placed. Next is the Battle of Fromel, 19th to the 20th of July, event to the north to support the Somme, but not part of the Somme battle. Uh, this is a diversionary attack to help the British forces on the Somme, uh, the British Third Army. Um, and they, they attack, but they don't have enough force. And the Germans, some places, they outnumber them two to one, the defenders. So the, the, the Australian division that attacks and some other British division attack, they take tremendous losses. There's 7,000 casualties. The Australian 5th Division takes 5,500 losses. The Germans only take about 700 to 2,000 losses. And, but on the date, the 19th, the Germans um, reorganized themselves in order to, to fight this offensive battle on the Somme. And General von, von Bilow has moved command a new army, the 1st Army of the North. And General Galvitz has moved in to command the, what's left of the second army, which remains the south, southern part of the Somme battlefield. And he oversees everything as well, you know, as controlling the and second armies as, as being army group Galwitz Somme commander. So he's wearing many hats here, he has many responsibilities, but he's in charge of this defensive battle now. Second phase of, of the overall Somme campaign, tied to September 1916, have uh, many attacks uh, counterattacks for Deville Wood, and it's a, it's a it's an absolute bath. Uh, this is a battle to secure the British right flank, and from the period third to the thirteenth of July, there's forty six separate British attacks, and you see a lack of coordination, a lack of unified strategy, a lack of you know everybody attacking at the same time, and the biggest one of these these forty six separate actions is the Deville Wood battle. It's uh, from the, the village of Longueval. They, they swarm into the woods there, which is a German strong point, and they fight over it for a long period of time. Uh, it sees the debut of the South Africans as Dominion forces. And the field at this time is turned into a series of fortified woods, villages, really important terrain, such as rivers. Again, there's very, very, very gain for this grinding battle for very small points of territory, which the commanders have fixated upon attack on the 22nd and 23rd of July by both French and British fail due to a lack of uh, coordination and communication. You see in the picture there, 
That's all that's left of Deville Wood after the absolute legally annihilating artillery bombardment. It's nothing left of it. You just see a little in the ground there. That's what used to be a trench. The Battle of Posius, 23rd July to the 7th of August. The first Australian division is in action here. And, uh, it's, it's a series of attacks and counterattacks to fight for this village of Posiers. If you look at the map there on the right, which end up taking the village in the, the north and east of it, which allowed them to look to the north and the fortified village of Val with, with its chateau, which is German, or its uh, a French house, which is very much destroyed by this stage. The Germans at the time are throwing in large numbers of new divisions and will commit 35 to revolving duty um, in the July-August period. This leads us to the Battle of Guillemont between uh, 3rd and 6th of September. You see the picture on the right there is the large part of the battlefield in this summer and late summer. It's moonscapes. There's no trees. There's no grass. There's no crops. There's no nothing left. Um, it's the largest German defensive here uh, effort here at this uh, village Mont, and it's uh, set to to defend a major British set piece attack to seize the village, which occurs on the third of September. Um, it's Guillemont, it's, it's a village on the right flank of the British sector. And the German defenses in the area were based on their second line of fortified villages and woods. Uh, attack somewhat broke the previous pause in operations in late August. By the French and British as they took time to organize themselves, but now at it. And General Haig and the French General Joffre, they're much, very much like uh, dogs with a bone or, you know, dogs with a stick in their mouths. They let it go and they attack relentless, relentless fashion. 29th of August, uh, the German Kaiser and the government uh, lost face in their chief of staff, uh, General von, Erich von Falkenheim, and he was replaced by General Hindenburg as the new chief of staff for the German general staff with Ludendorff, General Ludendorff, as his new quartermaster general. And this brings about a, a change in the, the tactics and doctrine of the German army. Um, this leads us to the Battle of Ginchy, 9th of September, shortly after the Guillemont Battle. Uh, the British 16th Division attacks Ginchy in the surrounding area. Uh, this would give the British observation of the German third line of defenses. And often these, these battles were to seize uh, high points where you could see the enemy or see a German position, because if you can see it, then you can call artillery fire on it and properly adjust artillery fire. After his failure on the 3rd of September, the village was captured on the 9th of September, and French attacks to the south were also successful in this time period. And this period somewhat also marked the, the high point of French success. So we now brings us beginning the third place. The phase of the campaign, Battle of Flair-Corchelette between 15th and 22nd of September. Uh, this was the last British major attack to break through or attempt to break through. Uh, um, it acts the German third line of defenses. It takes Morval, Lisboa, and Goudencourt. Uh, attacks by the French to the south, the river. Uh, the French attack was on the villages of Court and Rancourt to encircle the, the town of Combes. Uh, this is a very somewhat good tactical victory with relatively large territorial gains and high losses inflicted on the Germans whenever the Germans tried to counterattack. Use of tanks is seen also in the Battle of Corselet um, for the first time. These tanks largely they get stuck though they break down, and while they do scare the Germans, uh, their 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 impact is somewhat minimized. At this time, with the the new uh, leadership within the German army on the eastern and western fronts, we see a new flexible doctrine, getting away from the doctrine of Erich von Falkenhayn to the, the doctrine of, of Hindenburg, which allows German forces to man the front lines with a minimal force so as to uh, not let the British or French uh, bombard them with artillery and kill them all, but to keep reserves to the rear. And as long as the, the, the lost territory gained it's it's all right if they um the british and french manage to advance as long as reserves are possible to counterattack success so the this does to the battle of morval on the 25th to 28th september you see there's nothing much left of the side it's pretty much just a moonscape there if you look to the photo on the left this is an attack by the british fourth army um more Gudencourt and Ludwigs are attacked by the british opponent in the New German First Army, 
moved into the area and needed to control new reserves from 19 July onward. As the Second Army was facing uh, pressure, um, the attack supported by the French attacks on uh, Morval, Lewis, and Goodencourt, all these towns and villages fall. Of course, they're destroyed. There's nothing left of them, so they're, they're just captured wreckage. But it's this result for the British yet in the way of territorial gains, and this is the farthest, the farthest points they pushed forward. At this stage, the German divisions are facing a huge amount of attrition. They're getting replaced on the average one per day. They're getting removed and uh, replaced by new ones. The Battle of Thepval from the 26th to 28th September is also another one of the endless series of sub-battles. Um, Thepval Ridge was very fortified. The German strong near it were the Schwaben Redoubt and the Zollerein Redoubt, which is giant uh, five strong points. Organizational difficulties and bad weather hurt the attack of the British and Dominion infantry. Uh, some tanks, gas, and machines were used in large amount to support the attack, but the final objectives wouldn't be reached until um, after the October 1916. And at this time, heavy battles occur over the battlefield. German and uh, British air forces, as well as the French air force, uh, seek to gain uh, dominance of the air. Transloy Ridges, the 1st of October to 18th, 11th of November. These are a grinding, grinding series of battles as the weather surrounds against the Allies. Um, the British take breaks in their attacks uh, to uh, bomb the um, German line with more artillery fire, and uh, because of bad weather, it slows them down, and also lack of coordination, which is a constant factor within this camp. But this is the last big attack by the British Fourth Army. And by the end of October, administratively within the British lines, uh, their reserve army, which was, their official title was the reserve army, uh, be, becomes the fifth army. And this takes it in line to uh, the north of the fourth army. Uh, one of the last battles is the Battle of Anchorites from the 1st of October to the 11th of November. A lot of these battles, of course, take place concurrently. It's a very long grinding battle. This is the British uh, Fifth Army, which used to be called the Reserve Army. It's attacking north Thepeval and east Montemel. The British Fourth Army was to advance to the Perron Bopalm Road around Le Transloy, Bullion Court, Thiloy, Lopart Wood, that uh, north of the Albert Palm Road. The British Fifth Army completed the capture of German defense, uh, defensive lines uh, north of Corselet in the western part of Byzantine Ridge. Um, the Canadian Corps. This is uh, something important for Canadian military history. You see on the map there to the right, they attempt to capture uh, part of the ridge um, just north of uh, Corselet. Um, but it's it's somewhat of a, a disaster on the 8th of October. They're thrown back with very, very heavy losses. Uh, new German forces are at this time brought in to lead counterattacks. But, but there's times resistance by, by the unit commanders in the German lines. Uh, they don't want to see their units fought to annihilation and there's and then while they act sometimes they there's um a, a resistance rather slowly rather effectively and quickly by following, uh, commands from the german hitters uh, this time the stoffen and swap redoubts very strong german strong points they they fall british attacks nothing is left of the german trenches at this time it's just been completely obliterated now, uh, then the Germans are losing ground slowly but surely, and it does affect their morale. Uh, one of the final battles uh, leads us to the Battle of Ankara, 13th to the 18th of November. It's the last big attack of the year before winter sets in. The British attack up the, the Ankara River Valley. They wanted to exploit perceived German exhaustion. Haig was influenced by political and military concerns. He had to stop German troop transfers to Italy as the Italians begin to lose the war to the Germans. And there's pressure from the French to continue attacking and restore Allied morale. Um, a giant underground mine is blown up near Beaumont uh, Hamal, uh, called the Hawthorne Ridge um, Mine, which allows the British uh, to attack. Um, they, they, they seize Beaumont Hamel and Bucour sur la Ancre were captured. Uh, but the attack on Serre, if you look at the map there, the attack on Serre fails. Um, the Regina Trench finally falls north of Corselet, and uh, Saint Pierre de Vion was also captured. But these relatively small gains, small tactical gains, a village here, a village there, 
they mean rather, you know, not too much in the grand strategic scheme of things. So the campaign ends in November 1916. Both sides stop operations um, because of the weather and to allow their, their forces to rebuild. Uh, this law lasts until January 1917. Both sides are exhausted in the Somme sector. And the living conditions are so poor for the troops, they have to almost uh, exclusively focus on surviving and staying warm enough and well-fed enough to, to continue to fight or be effective military units in the future. So, conclusion. How, how to make sense of this historically? On a front of 26 kilometers, the British and French had advanced roughly 9.7 kilometers in total. 420,000 casualties for the British. That's killed, wounded, captured, sick. 200,000 casualties for the French. Well, roughly 440,000 German casualties. Briefly looking at these figures, you know, any, any student of the battle uh, can make a reasonable conclusion. Uh, regardless of the losses to the Germans, which were significant, the Anglo-French losses were worse, they were higher. Uh, the loss of this small territory uh, did not destroy the German Western Front at that time or destroy the German army. Uh, this would come later, I believe, in the 1917-1918 period. And some of the best German troops were in action during 1918, uh, during the Kaiserslacht offensives against the um, uh, British divisions. You know, they annihilate part of a British army and some of their offensives before they're, they're halted and their, their offensive operations are exhausted in 1918. So, the, you know, the, the argument that you know, the German army gets annihilated, you know, m large portions of do get annihilated, but it does all their good soldiers are destroyed. What do military historians think of it? There's one of the most premier ones, uh, William Philpott, a British military historian. Um, believes the Somme was a battle of attrition that would lead to the slow collapse of the German army. And by 1918, the slopes would uh, turn it from a series uh, or a, uh, a professional army to, to nothing than a militia not trained first-class soldiers. The school of thought holds that the battle has placed a breaking strain on the German army and that after the battle is unable to replace its losses with the quality. Key points hurting the Germans by the end of 1916 are morale, attrition, and frequent disputes. They weren't holding on to the land. They're forced in a, away from things in a series of uh, um, tactical defeats that were put upon them. Their land was being lost, I meant to say. Others, John Terrain, Jerry Sheffield, Christopher Duffy, Roger Chickering, Holger Heather, Herwig. They, um, the most strategic alternative for the, the French, they had to attack. And the, the technology was um, so limited, there's no chance for maneuver warfare or, or some kind of massive tank attack like you might see in, uh, that we saw in 1991 in Iraq, you know, Operation Desert Storm. The technology to overwhelm the enemy was not present, especially in the way of artillery mission, munitions. Uh, some of the British artillery shells are faulty, and the state of aircraft and tanks is very primitive. And there's lack of proper infantry tactics compared to what we see today uh, within some units of uh, the, some of the NATO armies. Uh, the soldiers were at times poorly led at a tactical level, you know, especially on the 1st of July when they're told to just walk forward. And they're, they're mowed down as they're walking line abreast. It's a, it's a terrible, terrible slaughter. Uh, Philip Barton, he uh, takes a contrasting approach. He's a television host and a historian. Uh, he does a series, did a series of uh, television specials on the Battle of the Somme, where he believes and he puts down the thesis that it's a German defensive victory. Um, the German losses uh, being, you know, heavy, but uh, the, the ground that was lost or lost to the French and uh, British advances strategically and tactically unimportant and more allied troops than wounded than the Germans. We hear that he somewhat argues that the British army began its own destruction. Uh, by wind, it was a much weaker force. Its divisions were had less people in their establishments. Uh, it was better trained and it had better weapons by 1918, but for raw combat power, the, 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 the British units were somewhat reduced by 1918. Uh, United States and Dominion forces in 1917-1918 providing a large sheer attacking combat power uh, for the eventual 1918 victories in the last year of the war. And there's the British artist Rob Hurt, 
And just to give a sense of the casualties, he's uh, you know an artist. And he's made 19,000 of these little cloth figures representing the, the ocean losses on the 1st of July 16. And this picture, it really it resonated with me. It, it sort of captured my imagination. He's laid them all out you know, in, in his artwork on um, this giant you know, soccer pitch or soccer field, a football field. And it's uh, somewhat shocking when you look at it, you know, when they're laid out that way, the sheer numbers of dead. Um, Post-war politicians and former soldiers, post-war period, Winston Churchill, you know, he very much objected to how it was fought, but he couldn't really suggest an alternative. Nothing could come to mind. There was no, no, no plan B that was better. Um, David Lord George, the prime minister, much appalled by the slaughter over for what he be, feels to be, you know, a relatively long period and uh, for very small territorial gains. Uh, Captain Little Hart, a British theorist, military theorist for the 1920s and 30s, this battle very much influenced his thoughts on how military oper operations should not occur. Uh, General Fuller, you see him there, there on the bottom right, the battle drove him to consider mechanized tank warfare in ways that he hadn't considered before. All published memoirs and books, all these people on the events and future warfare uh, in the 1920s and 30s of what war should be. Uh, Fuller, of course, goes on to become the famous Nazi thimp sympathizer and is shut out of the Second World War. Uh, this influences the, uh, the, sort of the lions led by donkeys. I'll say it again, lions led by donkeys, a uh, sort of theme that takes over British interpretation of the war and what gains its height in the 1960s. Um, and British people, you know, a large part culturally, culturally look towards the First World War uh, for its utter futility and terrible, terrible slaughter, which I, you know, looking at it, I, I don't believe that they're, they're wrong. Um, but this did mark also the beginnings of all arms combined warfare. But of course, the technology had to catch up. Uh, we see the debut of artillery, tanks, aircraft, all the widespread use of horrible weapons such as flamethrowers, uh, gas shells with you know various chemical con concoctions inside them, um, as well as new aircraft, new types of aircraft, and the beginnings of very primitive ground attack tactics for aircraft. And my conclusion, somewhat reading, this is my final slide here, but just giving her a read right from the slide. Uh, it's easy to say that this is the point where the German army began its road to destruction and disintegration we see in the fall of 1918. But I believe this is somewhat of an arbitrary judgment. You know, did it, did it really begin there? Um, Verdun was also going on. Um, the British and the French had to attack to relieve Verdun, and attack they did. There's no choice regarding goals. This is the only way they could achieve them. All the pre-war armies, look at all of them, their first rate war soldiers, professional soldiers, the large majority of them killed or wounded by 1916. In 1917 and 18, some of the biggest attacks were launched by Canadian and Anzac troops and corps. It wasn't some kind of coincidence. Some of the best British troops had been, really been killed and British divisions ever. If you compare a corps to the Canadian corps, the Anzac corps, the Canadian corps in 1917, 1918, much more powerful. The French were a spent force by 1917 and in a state of mutiny after the Nivelle Offensive. They were devastated by the, the twin battles of the Somme and Verdun, which were, you know, um, attritional backbreakers. And it was very lucky that a huge amount of forces from the United States did arrive in 1917 and 18 when they did. And the analysis of British historians is somewhat an effort, I feel, to place huge significance and achievement on this mass slaughter. You see the best men of the British Empire dying or being wounded horribly. And these were absolutely the best of the British citizenry. Um, citizenry, I guess, uh, that were, you know, could have gone on to do great things. You know, the, the owners, the factory workers, the factory foremen, the professionals, the doctors, the lawyers, any architects, what sort of country would the Great Britain and the United Kingdom say if these men had not been killed? Also, British historians have not to degree insulted French and German records of the fighting, given their somewhat their historical approach and Anglophone, Anglophone BEF silo mentalities somewhat. But um, these are just my conclusions and my opinions. There's many out there, and this is a very much a discussed and debated campaign. There we go. 
All right. So thank you very much for, for having me. And uh, hopefully I got through that. I didn't take, take up too much time. So thank you very much for this amazing presentation, Captain Arjun. It was really interesting topic and inspired for everyone. So what uh, we have some question, question that some of our students sent. We are going to answer one of them. I just like to hand over to David to get your start with some questions from the audience. David, ¿qué te parece si iniciamos con la sesión de preguntas que tenemos para el Capitán Artur? Empezamos pues, con la primera. Muchas, muchas gracias, Laura. Sí, tenemos varias preguntas que ha generado su brillante intervención. Nosotros nos han enviado algunas de ellas. Eh, vamos a empezar con la primera, que dice así. Las pésimas comunicaciones durante la batalla significaron que los comandantes sabían muy poco de lo que sucedía en el campo de batalla. El ejemplo lo tenemos en el primer regimiento de Terranova, que fue casi aniquilado mientras las tropas avanzaban hacia la tierra de nadie. ¿Cómo pudieron fallar las comunicaciones durante la batalla? Oh, uh, there's uh, uh, the runners may have, you know, they, they, a company that was attacking may send back a runner. That runner may be killed or by the time the runner reaches the um, battalion command post to speak with the battalion commander or pass his message, things might have changed at the front. Or uh, that once an attack that they thought was going well suddenly goes badly, um, you know, and it's a terrible situation where they're all getting machine gunned or there's heavy German artillery fire and the battalion commander would make the decision to commit further companies to the attack when, you know, is very much very dangerous and you know it would be throwing you know say if you're at the casino and you're throwing good money after bad if you if that's a, a term i don't know it's a, it's not a spanish term throwing good money after bad but yes uh, um and um the the complete lack of uh of radios you know radios were not carried on anyone's back and were not invented so they could be mobile at this stage and field telephones they would also be you know, sometimes they'd be effective, but as the battle moved away from them and the ability of uh, an observer to see what was actually happening, you know, uh, the, the the modern battlefield that we see today with drones that, you know, are constantly circling and we see the, the cameras uh, providing real-time intelligence, none of that was there. So, um, yes, uh, during the Battle of beaumont Mel with the Newfoundland Regiment getting annihilated, uh, some of the, the flare signals they had devised, you know, they'd shoot a flare into the air and that would mean a certain thing. But uh, for the Germans, they'd also shoot the same color flare, but it would mean an entirely different thing, such as, you know, bring in artillery fire uh, or something like that. So, you know, they were almost signaling to the Germans as well as signaling back to uh, the British Brigade and Division that the Royal Newfoundland or the Newfoundland Regiment was part of. En la segunda de las preguntas eh, que tenemos eh, para el Capitán Arthur Gulaxian es la siguiente. ¿Podemos decir que los británicos marcaron el éxito estratégico en la batalla, con lo que los combates en el Somme llevarían a los alemanes a suspender su ofensiva de cinco meses contra los franceses en Verdun? Um, yes, it was very much a success in, in that regard. Uh, the, the Germans had to stop their attack uh, at Verdun. Of course, this is something the German army was very happy to stop attacking. <laughs> they, they were very happy because they were getting slaughtered and they could go on the defensive and uh, defend what gains they had made. And of course, um, so yes, the, the Battle of the Somme did that. Uh, they were very much forced to attack now um, because the French were saying, you know, if we don't attack now, we're in serious trouble at the Somme if you don't help us right away. Uh, so there was a, a desperate sense of urgency um, would waiting a month, would it have really changed much of anything? I don't think so. But um, to, to stop the, the, the Battle of, of Verdun, um, it actually limited the, uh, the German losses as well. Hopefully I'm I, understanding the question there. Um, yeah, it's correct. It's, it's okay. right. Thank you. Thank you very much. La tercera de las preguntas que nos envían los alumnos es la siguiente. ¿Podríamos decir que el último esfuerzo de los aliados comenzó el 15 de septiembre, cuando los británicos participaron en la batalla de Flesh Coselet, la cual, como bien sabemos, eh, introdujo los primeros tanques de guerra? ¿Y cuál sería la consecuencia táctica y estratégica en la batalla al introducir los carros de combate? Um, yes, it was very much a success in, in that regard. Uh, the, the Germans had to stop their attack uh, at Verdun. Of course, this is something the German army was very happy to stop attacking. <laughs> they, they were very happy because they were getting slaughtered and they could go on the defensive and uh, defend what gains they had made. And of course, um, 
so yes, the, the Battle of the Somme did that. Uh, they were very much forced to attack now um, because the French were saying, you know, if we don't attack now, we're in serious trouble at the Somme if you don't help us right away. Uh, so there was a, a desperate sense of urgency. Um, would waiting a month, would it have really changed much of anything? I don't think so. But um, to, to stop the, the, the Battle of, of Verdun, um, it actually limited the uh, the German losses as well. Hopefully, I'm I understanding the question there. Um, yeah, it's correct. It's it's okay. right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Se dice que los eh, refugios británicos fueron muy eficientes en proteger a las tropas eh, cuando el bombardeo de artillería cesaba. Las ametralladoras salían y abrían fuego, devastando a los alemanes que avanzaban eh, hacia las posiciones de los británicos. ¿Cómo se puede planificar una batalla como aquella en la que murieron o resultaron heridos cientos de miles de hombres? Yes, um, the the British losses they somewhat uh, stabilize after the the lot heavy heavy losses of July, uh, where the the British are walking along. You know they think it'll just there's no Germans left. They think they're all dead, and there's a great slaughter with the machine guns. Uh, but the the sheer fact that um, you know, it just goes on and on. Haig is, is determined. And the Germans are also astonished at this. Um, and and until uh, Eric von Falkenhayn uh, is replaced, there's the status or uh, the doctrine of the instantaneous counterattack. So anytime a trench was lost, uh, the battalion commander would, would force his company commanders and platoon commanders to instantly counterattack. You know, there wasn't a plan to it. It's very much almost a spontaneous thing. And this inflicted many losses on the, the, the Germans. Uh, but the British didn't have as good dugouts as the Germans did. The Germans, you know, made it into almost a science where they have these subterranean layers that are used that use concrete and have electric power. And the outlook of the, the British Army sometimes in the first couple of years of the war, or the first year and a half anyway, was that they were not to make the dugouts too comfortable because that would make the, the troops not want to attack. But of course, as soon as the British would, would seize an enemy trench line or a series of enemy dugouts, they would fortify them and make them their own and attempt against the inevitable German counterattack to do what the Germans did to them. As the Germans attempt to counterattack, they'd, they'd slaughter them with artillery fire and machine gun fire and rifle fire. Um, but it was uh, is a terrible scene of these ruined trenches and ruined dugouts and very desperate men crawling all over them. And these were men with families at home and and you know that you know had businesses and would go on potentially or would have gone on to lead you know a successful life. And it's the the terrible futility of war as well as this almost industrial um, industrial uh, uh, definition of it. Uh, with thousands and thousands of men killed in one day, and and the both sides think, well, if we just kill them a little bit more, then it'll break the back attritionally uh, of them, and and the, they'll sue for peace, or their army will collapse, and they'll have to stop military operations. And so the British, they never give up, and it goes July, August, September, October, November, you know, into almost until it's snow is falling on the ground, and uh, the Germans, you know, continue their battle as well. Um, trying to make the British pay desperately for every single meter that they surrender. Y la última de las preguntas para el capitán Arthur Gulaxen es la siguiente. Eh, se dice que las tropas británicas fueron enviadas a la batalla el 1 de julio de 1916. Fue el día más sangriento de la historia del ejército británico, que sufrió más de 57.000 bajas, incluyendo cerca de 19.240 muertos. ¿Qué ocurrió con el ejército de voluntarios de Kitchener tras la batalla? Oh, yes, it's, um, it's an ongoing attrition. And... You know, people, they they should, if they don't, they should make the observation. If the British had continued this for another 30 or 40 kilometers, there'd be no British soldiers left. Because within the contents of an army, there's only so many infantrymen. And then they look at four, an army of 400,000 men. Well, that's not all infantry. And so these losses were, were actually tremendous, tremendous losses. And so very, very rapid. And the, the the true tragedy of it is that, you know, six or seven months in some places, maybe five, six months, seven months, eight months worth of training was just obliterated as fast as a machine gun bullet could come out onto the battlefield. Um, so this, this, these armies, they were replaced this um, by the, the terrible word of conscription. 
in the United Kingdom. And as the volunteers, the last volunteers disappear and suddenly, suddenly all, all the able-bodied young men in uh, Scotland and in England and in Wales, and they all decide, well, you know, we're not going to volunteer for the infantry anymore. Uh, conscription takes hold and they begin to also take reinforcements from other trades and re-roll them as infantry. And the British divisions are restructured so that they're, they still have the same number of divisions, but these divisions are weaker. And this is something that doesn't happen in the all-volunteer Canadian Corps. Well, it's all-volunteer until November and uh, December, January 1917, 1918, which conscription also takes place in, uh, takes effect in Canada. Um, but uh, we still see in the 1917 and 18 a very strong very well-trained, very well-armed British Army, uh, very, very effective attacking uh, on the flanks of the, um, you know, and is the centerpiece of the attack, you know, attacking with the Canadian and the Anzac troops and the Commonwealth troops and the Imperial troops and what's left of the Belgian troops. But, um, you know, the, the, there's a tremendous, tremendous losses in, in the year 1916. And of course, the tremendous losses of 1914 and 1915 and and so this is very much a battle of attrition, the First World War, you know, a, a long grinding campaign of attrition that the Germans eventually lose. And, you know, we overwhelm them. Also, the Americans arrive and um, the French manage to rebuild themselves somewhat in the later parts of 1917 and 1918 so they can recover from the Nivelle Offensive, that disaster in which the, the entirety of the French army ref doesn't, doesn't stop defending, but it refuses to attack, you know, in a state of almost, well, it was a mutiny, you know, they had seen the slaughter for these three years, three and a half years, and they wanted victory and it wasn't coming. So there's that, also this, this bond, this agreement, you know, I will trust you as my commander if you give me a fighting chance to achieve my battlefield objective without me getting killed or 100% chance of me getting killed. As soon as that covenant, that agreement, or that contract is, is somewhat weakened or broken, the morale collapses. And this is what happened with the French army. It didn't happen with the British army, but we see tremendous reverses as well as 1918 with the Kaiser Schlack battles in the last German attacks, which were very desperate, but um, some tremendous defeats for the British Army, weakening it even further. But hopefully that answers the, the question there. So excellent answer. We have more questions, but to do to the time constraints, we will forward answer to each person via email. So David, uh, I will tell you to continue a brief summary of today's uh, presentation of the Capitán Arthur. So, David, ¿qué te parece si iniciamos con un breve resumen de lo que fue la presentación del Capitán? Pues sí, muchas gracias, Laura. Eh, ante todo, agradecer al Capitán Arthur Gulaksen del Royal Military College de Canadá esa excelente y apasionante eh, ponencia sobre la, master, sobre la batalla del Somme que nos ha iluminado y nos ha aportado mucha más luz a esa gran historia de esa gran batalla y de esa gran carnicería que eh, tuvo el ejército británico el 1 de julio de 1916. Hay que recordar que el ejército británico libró su primera batalla de envergadura en el frente occidental, como bien nos ha ido explicando el capitán Arthur Gulaksen, durante la Primera Guerra Mundial. Hasta entonces, las tropas del Reino Unido habían combatido en un sector restringido bajo la tutela un tanto desdeñosa del ejército francés, que bien sabemos que soportaba el peso de la batalla de Verdún y que ahora insistía eh, a toda costa en que sus aliados ocuparan el lugar que debían y cargaran con la cuota de sufrimiento que les correspondía como pues, una gran potencia que era. Eh, también recordemos que había llegado el momento porque junto a las tropas profesionales y territoriales que habían luchado y sufrido al lado de Flandes, eh, se desplegaba ahora el New Army, eh, también llamado Ejército de Kitchener, por su impulsor, eh, formado por dos millones y medio de voluntarios alistados en el otoño de 1914 y entrenados durante 1915. Su origen, como bien nos, nos ha explicado el capitán Arthur Gulaksen, eh, se hallaba en el fervor belicista que se extendió por todos los condados nada más estallar la guerra, cuando oficinistas, agentes de bolsa, tendederos, futbolistas y estudiantes de las universidades más prestigiosas del Reino Unido o simplemente la juventud de pueblos y pequeñas ciudades se alistaron para formar los batallones de colegas llamados así para combatir juntos y desgraciadamente también morir juntos. El 1 de julio del 16, el Reino Unido se lanzó al asalto contra las trincheras alemanas en la batalla del Somme y durante los cinco meses siguientes, sus soldados sufrieron, murieron y resultaron heridos en una de las batallas de desgaste más terroríficas de la Primera Guerra Mundial. 
con ello dar las gracias a Arthur por esta magnífica y bien detallada clase eh, de esta ponencia que nos ha eh, aportado en, esta, en este seminario de la Primera Guerra Mundial eh, sobre la Batalla del Somme y sobre todo también sobre sus protagonistas, las estrategias, las tácticas de ambos bandos y sobre todo los principales combates en la campaña llevada a cabo por las tropas aliadas en general y en concreto las canadienses. Aunque hay otras cifras devastadoras, como recordemos el primer regimiento de Terranova de Canadá, que tuvo un 91% de bajas de sus 2.000 hombres aquel fatídico 1 de julio. Una cifra equivalente al 10% de la población de la isla, entre los míticos nombres de las grandes batallas de la Gran Guerra, el Marne, Verdun, Calípoli o Tannenberg. La del Somme permanece y permanecerá, permanecerá siempre eh, velado, ensombrecido, por la certeza de que fue una de las batallas más sangrientas e inútiles de toda la Primera Guerra Mundial. Muchas gracias, Laura. So, to let's continue, I introduce our next speaker, Heiner Brockenmann. He is a Lieutenant Colonel PSD and a branch head and deputy head of the Education Department and the Center for Military History and Social Science of the Bundeswehr in Postman, Germany. He is a lecturer at the University of Postman, chair of the War Studies, and elect member of the German branch of the International Commission of Military History. So, Let's welcome again, Lieutenant Colonel. It's so good to have you here today. And thank you so much for joining us. The audience is all yours to begin your presentation. Hello. Yeah, you can start with your presentation. Ah, okay. So I start with my presentation. It's uh, about Hindenburg, Ludendorff, and the Battle of Tannenberg, 1914. So... I will uh, first, what you already heard now, <laughs> what I do, perhaps it's uh, what I do also is a little bit uh, consultant, be a consultant of a museum or museum management consultant. And uh, this is uh, what I will do next year. For example, we are doing exposition or big uh, museum exposition on the team of heroes, heroes in, uh, yeah, in all uh, all aspects and uh, what i tell you today is a little bit about heroes they they were heroes ludendorff at hindenburg were very famous german heroes but uh, after 100 years this uh, uh, they they not forgotten but uh, or they they only mentioned in a really bad um, connection towards hitler and uh, But Hindenburg and Ludendorff started as soldiers in the Prussian army. And so I will show you uh, first what's about this battle and its myth. And uh, we will look at, uh, after the introduction, look at the personalities uh, of the, uh, what, uh, what happened to Hindenburg and Ludendorff uh, from entering the army up to the Battle of Tannenberg. And then we'll see what's uh, the Schlieffenplan, the famous Schlieffenplan has to do with this battle and why the Schlieffenplan is one reason for the problems uh, Hindenburg and Ludendorff should uh, solve in the beginning of the First World War. And then it's about the battle or the battles because Tannenberg is a very big battlefield and there are, it's not only one battle, there are a lot of smaller and bigger battles during this uh, this uh, days or these days in August 1914. And then this is the question of the fame. Uh, Ludendorff and Hindenburg, uh, first of all, became extremely famous after this battle. And they, they, they started in a way a new life. And Hindenburg, in, in, a, in an age when normally uh, people stayed at home uh, as pensioners, He stayed a second career after this Battle of Tannenberg. So, how or a, where can we normally read uh, f uh, about this battle? And it's uh, in the beginning after the First World War. It was the German, uh, the army was rather small after the Treaty of Versailles, but a lot of officers found. Uh, work at the so-called Reichsarchiv 
It's the Imperial Archive, which was in Potsdam, and they wrote the history of the First World War. And uh, in uh, 1925, they had already the second volume of this history, and it's about the liberation of East Prussia. And uh, several years after this, 1928, Walter Elze wrote a real famous book on Tannenberg, and uh, for about 50 50 years or so, the people normally wanted to wanted to know about Hanberg. They took Elze. They they took a book from the Reichsarchiv, and they Hindenburg and Ludendorff did also something to yeah to sharpen uh, the historians' minds in their way. And this was rather a quarrel, but I won't focus on this today. And there were also books rather interesting from Russia, because a lot of Russians fled for the Russian revolutions. They left Russia uh, fearing the communists. And one of them, Yuri Danilov, he was uh, 1914 in the high command uh, of the Russian army. And he wrote a book in 1925, how it was in this high command and how he saw from Russia these uh, really hard battles in 1914. And what I find it's the also very interesting book is from Winston Churchill. And he wrote a book, The Unknown War. And what's interesting is that this Eastern Front uh, was really unknown up to 100 years, uh, because after the year 2000, a lot of historians um, thought, okay, we have to look at the East of this war. Normally, all the historians look on to the Western Front, to um, the the war front in the colonies, uh, or to uh, on the, the war at sea, but the Eastern Front was nearly forgotten for a long time. So uh, this is uh, one thing. And what Danilo wrote uh, is a little bit like um, the Russians uh, very quickly uh, took over the attitude towards their own uh, own military, which was uh, normally uh, uh, yeah, was normally uh, in the books of German historians. Perhaps Danilov a little bit looked up what the Germans wrote and thought, okay, it must be true what uh, in these the German books. But a little bit he's only talking about insufficient readiness hasty approaches and the exhaustion of the troops and it's only the reconnaissance what is, was inadequate and they were poorly organized in the case of, for example, the Asian and they had a totally wrong assessment of the situation. And uh, this was one reason, but the Russian army was not so bad at all. And you can see it when you look at the Eastern Front uh, from 1914 to 1917, and even 1916, 17, there are some parts where it, it lasts a long time uh, to the victory of the Germans at the Eastern Front. It was not a quick run after Tannenberg, and uh, this happens also with a rather you know, never-ending uh, masses of troops of, of the Russian army. And uh, we will see that... Uh, Tannenberg was not a decisive victory. It was a big victory, but not really decisive. And uh, in the others, uh, on the other way, the Russians did for France and Britain, the Russians did a good work in the East because in a the way they, uh, they did their part of uh, allied work against Germany to, uh, to, 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 to force the Germans to concentrate on the Eastern Front and uh, not only on the Western Front. And for the last 30 years, there's, there was a book from uh, Dennis Showalter, which I think this is a classic book on Tannenberg in English. And he did it excellent, an excellent way. And uh, uh, between 1991 and uh, 2021, we have one book of my German colleague, Gerhard Groß, Colonel Groß, wrote an overall history 
of German operational thinking. And in 2021, my uh, good comrade John Zimmermann wrote a book on Tannenberg. He took the book from Lennon Showalter and uh, re it's a kind of revision of everything we knew uh, about this Battle of Tannenberg. And I think it's uh, quite a very interesting book. Uh, I, I think it should be written in English also because a lot of uh, interesting, um, uh, interesting aspects uh, came to into light uh, during this work. And I sometimes concentrate on what he wrote in his new book. So for Tannenberg, there's one side. It's the myth of a decisive victory. The question is, was it a decisive victory? But it was an important victory. And on the other side, it's this myth of proof of superiority of the German military. Um, with this victory, it seems that the German military is uh, uh, in in the professional manner is absolute superior to Russia or to others in a way. And uh, on the other side, we have this General Hindenburg, who became a personal myth. He became the savior of East Prussia, and you see it on this postcard. Uh, it's written only about uh, about my dead body. Uh, goes your way, Colossus. Colossus is Russia. And so Hindenburg stands on East Prussia and one foot on Russia, one feet in East Prussia and is protecting the Eastern Front of Germany in a way alone. This is, um, uh, yeah, this is a typical situation in the beginning of the First World War. And there is a, also a rather old question of historical revenge because uh, the name Tannenberg um, goes back to uh, Grunwald. Uh, Tannenberg is the German name for this battle in 1410. And Grunwald is the name the Polish uh, nation normally uh, remembers it. It's uh, a mythical battle. It's a real battle between Germanics. It's uh, the Teutonic Order, the Knights of the Teutonic Order here with their uh, black and white flags. And they were fighting against Polish Lithuanian forces. And this is not far away from the Battle of uh, 1914. And Hindenburg, he knows a new history, he knows history very well. He asked the Kaiser uh, for this name because of this uh, revenge uh, between Germanics and Slavs. So it's a, a rather yeah, a myth from the beginning of this uh, battle in 1914. And Hindenburg is not only the liberator of Eastern of East Prussia, he became a charismatic and political leader, and he rised between, you see it here on the left side is uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany, on the other side is the Austrian Kaiser uh, Franz Josef, and so Hindenburg as a general, he is between the monarchs and uh, on the ground is a bleeding Russian bear, and behind him the troops of Germany cheering. And you see in the air the Zeppelin and airplanes. He's a modern, a modern savior with technic and modern weapons uh, between rather old monarchs. Uh, this is uh, what became, uh, especially for William II, uh, in a way, he was not a fan of Hindenburg. But for William II, the problem was his wife was a real Hindenburg fan, so he had the problem in his own household. Nice. He had to take uh, care not to lose his influence, but uh, uh, as I said, Hindenburg was charismatic in his, in his manner. He, he was a rather calm, uh, and uh, he was a little bit... Um, learning during uh, the first month of this war how to behave to become a real uh, idol of the German military and the German people. So, and for a battle, you have to see the battle in East Prussia is on a really hard and difficult battleground. 
Uh, you see pictures of the so-called lakes. Uh, we have an anthem in East Prussia. It's the land of dark forests and of crystal lakes. It's a lot of lakes, a lot of forests, and mm, not mountains, but um, you see some high spots where you can put artillery and not only, and here is, uh, you see the lakes. And for a defender, it's uh, rather interesting to use the lakes and uh, rivers for defense, but for the attack and for defense, it's extremely difficult because you have to uh, look in every direction and have to, have to plan all your movements on the terrain. And this is extremely difficult in East Prussia. And it's a big battlefield. Normally, I don't know, everyone knows Waterloo. In Waterloo, you can walk in, in an hour or two on the battlefield. It's not so, it's not so uh, far away. But the battlefield of Tannenberg is about 70 kilometers long and 60 kilometers broad. It's a real big battlefield. And so it's this image of a leader standing on a hill and leading his forces. This is not uh, what we could expect on this battlefield. And this is a part of the myth, the mystical leader standing on his hill. No, this is not what we had in Tannenberg. It's a real, real big battlefield with a lot of smaller and bigger battles. I now come to Hindenburg and Ludendorff. And I called it a happy marriage because Hindenburg wrote in his uh, memoirs that they both had a kind of happy marriage. They worked so good together that uh, normally uh, they won't, won't have to talk much sometimes. And uh, they, they functioned uh, in, in a very deep understanding. And this was perhaps on the personal, but I think also more on professional level. They were both Prussian officers and they had the same uh, the same uh, education from childhood on, uh, in a way, 20 years difference. Hindenburg was 20 years older than Ludendorff about, but uh, they started both as cadets in the German and Prussian cadet corps. Paul von Hindenburg, he, from a cadet, uh, entered the, uh, the Prussian army uh, in the third regiment of foot guards, a uh, uh, rather high regiment, uh, uh, honorable in the guards in Berlin. It was a good start normally for an officer. And what also was good for him, he started with the major German wars of unity. He entered the Austro-Prussian War in 1866. He fought at the Franco-German War in 1870. And he became a Prussian general staff officer with all typical uh, uh, typical uh, duties from uh, yeah, staff uh, duties, uh, teaching duties at the Kriegsakademie. He was a tactics teacher and uh, commander, uh, commanding posts. Uh, he was the regiment commander. And here you see in 1900, he was division commander. Uh, and in 1903, he became corps commander in Magdeburg. Magdeburg, a town between Berlin and Hanover. And he stayed there for a rather long time. And for an officer, this was a really good career. It was a top career of an officer in the Kaiserreich. And so in the end, he said he did everything. And uh, there was no war in sight. He perhaps he waited some years, sometimes say, okay, when a war is, I want to become a leader of my forces in, in the war, but what the war didn't didn't came to him. And so he decided to retire as a general of the infantry and went to Hanover to retirement and uh, stayed at home and uh, yeah, watched the uh, newspapers and read the newspapers. And uh, in 1914, he tried to get a command again. What's interesting for his personal, um, can say his personal um, uh, inner inner uh, professional attitude is that in Königgrätz in 1866, 
he was wounded. And you see in the middle is his helmet, his spike helmet. This helmet, he, he got wounded uh, at his head and uh, he put a towel around his head and uh, carried on the battle. And for him, it was, uh, he was saved, his life, he was safe, and he kept this helmet in all his offices up to his death. And this is a, a picture of his office in Hanover, I think. And uh, this is for him a remembrance that he took the right profession because in the battle he saw he could stand this, being a soldier in a battle, and that he became during this battle rather calm, that he wasn't really upset. And so this, uh, this uh, fighting and knowing this is not frightening me at all, it's, it's in a way it was because he was normally when he is talking about a fierce war he was only talking uh, about 1870 71 more than the second world war but for him it was a real uh, baptism a uh, fire a uh, fire uh, in in the battle and he knew i'm right in the military in sedan 1870 it was again one of the biggest German battles, and he was one of the soldiers fighting uh, towards the center. It's again an encirclement of the French army in Sedan, and it was some, um, in a way, it was a uh, the, the, the typical idea of the German military leading a quick war and getting a total. Uh, annihilation of the enemy or to, uh, of an encirclement of enemy forces. And this was also Sedan in 1870. And uh, in, on the 18th of January in 1871, Hindenburg was one of the officers who was at the castle of Versailles where the German Empire was founded. During the war, the Germans founded their empire in France, in the imperial, uh, in the uh, castle of uh, of the French kings, and this was really for Hindenburg also, uh, yeah, a very um, important experience being at the moment of the birth of the new German Reich. On the other side, we have Erich Ludendorff. He was much younger. He was modern Prussian, had a modern Prussian military career, also cadet, uh, infantry officer. He was a kind of Marine. He was uh, in, at the Sea Battalion, so-called Marines of the German armies. And he became the uh, general staff officer, but more uh, one of the office, as in office workers. He was very good at uh, plan making and he was responsible for the Schlieffen clan and for the plans of uh, the taking of the fortress of Liège in Belgium. And then also regiment commander, infantry brigade commander in 1914. And for him, his biggest experience was taking the, uh, the citadel of Liège in 1914. You see here on the postcard is uh, General, on the left it's uh, General von Emich, who was responsible for taking Liège. And Ludendorff was a so visiting officer in a way. He was, uh, because he was uh, very long time, he, he was thinking about the taking of this uh, citadel. He was uh, in a way uh, looking after the troops as a kind of visitor. But then the commander of the infantry brigade at Liege fell and he took over command and led the forces uh, uh, through the through the the cordon of the the, the the force the force of the age to the center of the town, and what was rather funny, he and his car and his driver they drove through the city up to the citadel, and the infantry took another way, and so uh, Ludendorff as a general was earlier than the infantry. And he knocked at the citadel's door, which is shown at the uh, other picture here. And he knocked at the citadel's door and demanded uh, them to to hand out uh, the citadel for him to him. And uh, this was, in a way, made him rather famous in Germany 
because it was a lot funny and was like a hero. He took this in a way one man uh, took a citadel, and uh, but it lasted some days after this to take the whole town. And he, uh, he and von uh, und von Emich, they both got the highest German uh, order of merit, the Polymerit, for this action. And what you can find in the war memoirs of uh, David Lloyd George is a little bit what became the difference between the two men, between Hindenburg and Ludendorff. Because uh, David Lloyd George asked after the war, Marshal Foch, a French marshal, what he thinked, uh, what he thought about the two military officers. And he said, uh, Ludendorff, he was a bon soldat, a good soldier. And Hindenburg, he was a great patriot. And, and I think it's, it's a day, it's interesting that David Lloyd George mentioned this because it's, I think it's the right direction in a way. You know? And, uh, but, uh, before we look at the battle, we see a little bit what is the base, basic plan for these first battles of the First World War. And this uh, is in connection to the Schlieffen plan. The Schlieffen plan is a plan to have a very quick victory. The Germans need a quick victory because they are in the center of Europe and the enemies of Germany are in the east and in the west. And the problem is, when everyone is attacking Germany from all sides, the German forces have the problem to defend themselves. So they thought we can make a plan to first beat France. And then after France is beaten, after several weeks, we concentrate on Russia. And the idea was Russia is a big state is not so uh, uh, good organized like France, the train system, the soldiers, they had to organize mobilization. It lasts a long time. And on the other side, France is an enemy which is uh, normally like Germany. They prepared for mobilization. It's, it's a matter of hours perhaps or several days to mobilize the army. And so the Germans thought we put of our eight armies, seven armies, we attack, let, we let them attack in the West. And one army is concentrated, well, more or less left alone in the East to defend the East. And they were no, more or less hoping that after four weeks, the victory is near and the other, the armies can join, uh, a new a new battle against Russia, or perhaps Russia will surrender and quitting because uh, as alone against Germany and Austria, Russia will perhaps uh, um, end the war and did, uh, won't fight. But this was an idea. And uh, in the planning the war before 1914, it was rather clear for Germany that perhaps this would not work. But they had only this plan. It was only one plan for victory. This was the best plan for victory the German military fought. And this led, you see it on the map, in four weeks they were next to Paris, but then this offensive stopped near at the Marne. And uh, this is for Germany a total disaster, but the war, war lasts several years. Huh? But the plan didn't work. And in the east, you see it here, there the Russians more or less concentrate on the Austrian Hungary forces. And against Germany, normally only two armies uh, uh, were marching towards East Prussia. And you see in East Prussia, this uh, Eighth Army, this is the army uh, where Hindenburg and Ludendorff will, uh, will lead this army to the victory at Tannenberg. But you see the army of Rennenkampf and Samsonov, two Russian generals, they were heading towards East Prussia. 
and in the south, uh, four armies are concentrating against uh, uh, Austria-Hungary. But what was rather surprising was a rather quick Russian attack towards Germany. Uh, they, they attacked uh, in with two armies, and uh, this was for the Germans a rather surprise. And uh, yeah, in the other way, they they had they want to concentrate to take the last uh, kilometers before Paris, and they they didn't want to to lose forces in the west to support the Eighth Army. But uh, in, a, in the end, uh, the Eighth Army was alone to defend against uh, two Russian big armies. And when we see the battle and ask what happened at Tannenberg, first, not much, because the first battles were fought in the region. Uh, again, as I show you, can you see this when I move this? Yes. Uh, Tannenberg is this area, rather south, and the first battles, 1940, took place here in this area at Stalupön and Gumbin. And this was uh, the army of Rennenkampf, who fought against the German commander of the Eighth Army. It was uh, General von Britwitz on Gafron. And the question was, it's a crisis, yes, but it's two to one. Is it really two to one? Uh, for us, it's clear. We see this on the map. But uh, for the people, you, you have to evaluate the situation where you are. And normally, everyone is looking for a kind of local superiority. And um, the question is also, what becomes dangerous? Also, which force becomes dangerous and when? So I can prepare, concentrate, I can take forces from one from place to another. And uh, on the other side, uh, without knowing much, they knew there are two armies coming. We are only one army here, and we should have we should have another plan. And so the question is, do we have another plan for this in the draw? And they had a plan because uh, before 1914, a lot of uh, military uh, maneuvers were held and, and they were thinking what happened in the case we have only one army against the Russians. And the plan was moving towards the west, moving towards uh, the Weichsel, or the Vistula River. And uh, this meant you have to give up whole East Prussia. And uh, then the question is, how, well, how far can we plan? Can we plan for a week? Can we plan for days? And um, in this thinking and thinking and thinking, they had to communicate this to the German high command. The German high command was in Koblenz in the west. And the high command was concentrating on attacking France. And they wanted a rather decisive leadership in the east and not so much thinking and quarreling. And on the other side, the head of the German high command, the, the, the head of the German general staff, uh, General von Molke, the younger, he knew Ludendorff because Ludendorff was one of his officers in his staff. And he wanted Ludendorff to solve this problem in the East. But Ludendorff was a very young officer still, and uh, he could not lead the Eighth Army. And he needed a general who is uh, who will not disturb him to solve this problem. And they thought of Hindenburg, because Hindenburg wrote letters, he, he talked to people, he wanted a new command. And uh, the people knew Hindenburg, he was a good officer, some said uh, that even Hindenburg was one time planned for general staff or the head of general staff, but I only read this once in a book, but normally Hindenburg was a very good officer, but he was not a very uh, officer with much initiative. And uh, Ludendorff was, has too much initiative in a way, 
And so they put together a rather calm officer and with a lot of, yeah, in a way, calm charisma and a, a, a high, highly alerted, uh, moving, steadily moving, steadily working officer who was Ludendorff. And when you see uh, films of a 1914, you see Ludendorff rather moving and uh, Hindenburg rather calm man and so and they are a kind of dream team in a way uh, because this worked in military matters for several years no? and uh, on the 22nd of August in 1914 the high command decided to change the command General von Britwitz and his uh, chief of staff Waldersee they had to leave and Hindenburg and Ludendorff came by train from the West and took over command of the 8th Army. And while they are on train driving towards East Prussia, the 8th Army was already doing what they planned because they had this plan moving to the West, to the Weichsel River, which you see on the left side, and now comes this castling of forces, like in a chess game. The first army corps marched and drove by train and changed the sides from the pace near the Rennkampf army to the attacking army of Samsonov in the south. And why can they leave this place? Uh, it's because Rennenkampf did a rather good job in attacking the Germans, but was not really clear if he had a real victory. As he had, he had fierce battles, um, uh, especially against the First Corps. They were fiercely attacking him, and uh, he lost uh, several, uh, several, several smaller, smaller battles. But in a way, he was still in Germany now. And he was not sure, uh, um, is, is it possible to attack against Königsberg? Königsberg was the target in a way. And he didn't knew really if his general colleague, Samsonov, was attacking in a manner uh, which was useful for him. So the both armies were attacking and they were not really uh, good in communication. Uh, today, People know or think that they both they hated each other. They had some had some problems in the Russian-Japanese War years ago, and uh, they had uh, some arguments even with uh, uh, beating each other, and so they hated each other. This is what uh, everyone seemed to know in those times. But uh, except uh, with the exception of of hate, they had a really bad communication. Uh, it's it's bad communication. They had uh, radio, open radio. They had uh, the, the 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 open radio was uh, heard was was uh, um, the German reconnaissance in a way knew what the Russians planned. Uh, but on the other side, I have to say, you no, know, the German reconnaissance knew a lot. But what the German reconnaissance knew. Was not uh, no uh, was not uh, what the the several German generals knew in the field. They had in a way their own problems. But um, when you see this, this is the situation when Ludendorff and uh, Hindenburg arrived. Now was the question: It's how do we know what the Russians want? I said it's uh, reconnaissance. They had cavalry, they had uh, airplanes and reconnaissance. They had radio, uh, um, uh, radio uh, reconnaissance uh, troops. They, they especially from Königsberg, they were listening to the Russian radio station in the field. And the, the question was to, to have information of the enemy to allow commanders to make well-informed decisions. And this was in the every different level, was it was really different. Sometimes the Ludendorff had an idea what he wants to do, 
and he gave orders, but some generals didn't obey. They didn't do it. Or Ludendorff had old informations, and the 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 situations already changed. So everyone had to adapt uh, in new, at new situations. And uh, when you see these uh, red and blue uh, signs on the map, sometimes there are 50,000 people moving when you see this. There are 20,000, 50,000. They are moving through this terrain, woods and lakes, and sometimes they're really vanishing. There are several thousand people where Okay, you know they are in the battlefield. In, they are in this battlefield, but it was not really clear where they are. Are they moving? Are they fighting? Or uh, what? What? Do we, uh, and though so, the reconnaissance was was very much needed, and it was not so good organized on the German side, and not at all so it seemed on the Russian side. And. After the war, people tried to hide these problems in a way. They want to show this uh, superiority of the German army even after the war. And they wrote, uh, in a way, Ludendorff allowed the subordinate to move freely. He watched always. That was it's about 80 kilometers. He, he couldn't watch always. But he said he could. And uh, who was never afraid to intervene and, if necessary, to dispose of the divisions over the head of the commanding generals. This is not really true. This is what Ludendorff sometimes tried, but in it didn't work this, this way. But this is how people wrote and think, okay, they, they had to explain uh, a kind of higher leadership uh, and they, they tried to explain to themselves how the victory was won. And this was not so easy. And you see a place like this. This is a famous picture where Ludendorff is standing on his, yeah, on his hill, General's Hill, on the battlefield in near Tannenberg. It's not so far away, but, but you see Hindenburg is standing. Ludendorff is holding the map. And uh, the uh, uh, Hoffman, uh, Colonel Hoffman, is responsible for operational planning. He is looking, looking <clears throat> on the battlefield. Then you see soldiers using a telephone, modern technique, and in the air there's an airplane reconnaissance. So it's the image of a modern battle, but when you see this real big battlefield, it's not possible to lead from a place like this, a battle like this. And this is the time of this myth. And on this place later on was made a little monument stone to remember this. But these images were very important uh, and uh, they were these uh, images were normally bought by cities like Hanover. But this image was in Potsdam after the First World War. It was part of uh, the assembly room of uh, the Potsdam magistrate, and it burned uh, during the Second World War. So everyone thought we had a kind of new Kane. Kane is an antique battle with a total defeat of uh, the enemies, the Romans uh, won. And so uh, a lot of German thought, okay, we would have a second Kane at Tannenberg. But uh, the General Hoffmann, who was uh, responsible as a colonel for operations of the Battle of Tannenberg, he knew what it was. It was not this planning from the beginning. It was developing, in a way, during this, these days in August 1914. And it's not a result of uh, Rennenkamp's uh, inactivity. Uh, this helped the Germans a lot winning this battle. So the end game of the battle is a little bit the south here. You see, I will see Tannenberg. I put a red. I will put a laser pointer. Yes. Um, this is Tannenberg. Here is Tannenberg, but a lot of the happened at Allenstein today. Olsten, all spoke. You see, the battlefield is much bigger than only Tannenberg, and this is the end game. 
And I will concentrate a little bit on the first core. The first core of General Hermann von Francois, they, in the first days of August, they had these battles of Stalupön and Gumbin, the battles against Rennenkampf in the north. And then the core went on the way to the south, this castling or Rochade. And then he had this battle of Ustau, you see here, Francois. And at Ustau, he managed a kind of breakthrough. For Ludendorff, this was the decisive breakthrough of the whole battle. And then he ordered Francois to attack Tulane. This is around here. But Hermann von Francois decided, no, I don't know, I don't do this. And he attacked in this direction towards Neidenburg and Willenberg because he thought this is a decisive move for the battle. And in the end, Ludendorff said, okay, this is true, this was true. But the general disobeyed. And even at Ustau, he disobeyed because Ludendorff wanted him to attack very soon. But uh, Francois waited a day or more. He waited because he wanted his soldiers uh, for a little bit uh, uh, to, to feed themselves, to, to cooking, uh, to, to, to rest a little bit because they had a lot of battles uh, during these days and he wanted the soldiers to rest a day. And so that was this resting one day was a very good idea because while they stayed here, the Russians marched north and this, uh, this came, uh, it, it's, it's, it was a kind of, uh, yeah, um, uh, it was a kind of uh, uh, yeah, luck, uh, uh, war, uh, luck and war that the Germans moved northwards and they stayed here. And when he was attacking, this became the decisive move. And when he saw this, he was very much pressing uh, on his soldiers to move on, to move on, because uh, Francois realized that this is the decisive encirclement in a way here. And uh, this is the end of the battle, what we see here, and in this in this situation, the commanding general Samsonov, they told his officers, "Yeah, you you are free to move in a way," and he uh, left uh, his his command post and in a way lost his way a little bit in the woods and he shot himself, and this is uh, suicide uh, as. Uh, kind of total uh, sign of a total victory of the Germans when the general is killing himself and uh, this uh, army is vanishing in the end of this battle. So, And Winston Churchill, he thought that General Hoffmann as the operational officer and uh, von Francois, these two are the real victors of the uh, of Tannenberg, because Francois is a socially genius. He is a, is really a, a, a yeah. He's a, he's a not you won't think he's a thinker in a way. He's a kind of pattern in a way. But um, in the end, uh, General von Francois, he became honorary uh, doctor. Also he had a Phil D honorary Phil D of the University of Tübingen because after the war, he wrote a lot on military history and on this battle. And Francois thought this of the battle. As we historians, we were recognized that it was a battle of command friction. And this was really like this. And uh, Ludendorff himself, the master general in a way, Ludendorff himself said it was his proudest memory, but purely improvised battle. It was a purely improvised battle. And uh, from the position of the 23rd August, daily they were changing positions and every day thinking what's, what will happen next. They had no master plan for this. They were organizing it as professional officers, professional soldiers, organize this on a daily basis. But as you heard already, it was not organized by high command and lower command. It was really a little bit chaotic in a way. 
but everyone was professionally enough to to in the end to to change this battle into a victory for germany so and then the myth of tannenberg ended in august with a victory a total victory in reality the russians were there the first army was still there and they had the battle of the missourian lakes and it lasted until February 1915. In February 1915, the last Russians left East Prussia. And then this battle in Germany ended. But this was also Hindenburg and Ludendorff. And they had, uh, they, they, but they, the people talked about Tannenberg and they expected nothing to happen after Tannenberg because Hindenburg is with his calm manner and Ludendorff, they expected them to win. And uh, it worked the first months. The losses of the battle, it's not so real clear. We have the Germany, 12,000 or 30,000 dead, missing and wounded. For the Russians, it's about this uh, second army. It's 120,000. Uh, but only 5,500 dead, but a lot, 75,500 about missing and taken prisoner. These are the last uh, uh, numbers we have in our book from 2021 for the Russian side. No? And then Hindenburg asked the Kaiser uh, to, um, to name the battle after Tannenberg, and, and you see, Hindenburg knew this history very well because he wanted to, to wipe out the notch of 1410. After Tannenberg, the question eternal fame, we have pictures. And Hindenburg spent a lot of hours during the day uh, with his painter, Hugo Vogel, who lived in his headquarter in a way. And this is a typical picture where Ludendorff was the worker and Hindenburg was the leader and the thinker. And Ludendorff was very much upset about this picture because he told the painter, please paint Hindenburg a little bit that he's looking more to my, what I do because uh, it looks like uh, he knows everything and he has to work for it. So in a way, he was kind of military genius, but he was a charismatic type and he knew very much uh, propaganda and uh, he's a modern, in a way, he's, uh, Hindenburg was a modern general. He knows how to uh, make self-marketing in a way. He was very modern in this way. And this is a typical day after the Battle of Tannenberg for Hindenburg. He was working, he was once in the morning at the staff he was taking walks, lunch, and he had his famous midday nap. He was uh, sleeping a lot normally. And in the evening, he was more doing excursions, sometimes uh, during the battles uh, against Russia. Uh, he had a boat on a lake in East Prussia. It was given to him by a famous uh, editor in Germany. And uh, he was uh, doing uh, hunting and driving his boat. So he, he had a rather nice life there. But he is really the commanding general because in the evening, he had his evening receptions. And he is uh, doing a lot of politics in a way. Uh, Ludendorff is doing the leadership of the military. And uh, Hindenburg is more and more doing this policy to getting these two people, Hindenburg and Ludendorff, to the top of the German military. And this lasts some time, but they were too very good in working on this. In the end, they are the top military leaders in the First World War, in the German army. And uh, they end this war in, in 1918. And Hindenburg is, in the end, even, uh, I think he's, he's a better thinker, a politically thinker. Uh, Ludendorff is, uh, lost its nerves in 1918. And Hindenburg stayed in office up to 1919. And uh, his image as a protector of Germany, he could protect this image too. 
And so he prepared for uh, being an uh, influential person after 1919 also. So he had some uh, critics, Colonel Hoffmann, he liked to tell this because Hindenburg slept a lot during the battle and he made this uh, funny joke uh, for quite often when he was uh, guiding visitors over the battlefield. And uh, on the other side, during the war, the chancellor said, he is a terror of our enemies. Hen Hindenburg became the terror of German enemies. He was, from the outside, the terror. From the inside, he was a person of identification. And you see this the postcard. It's against the Russian steamroller. He's blowing it away. You can see him as a knight here, like the. No? He is fighting as a knight, like in 1410. And on this picture, there is Europe is fighting. And you see Hindenburg is, I think, is the only person you can see. He is here with an axe and beating the Russians' hands. And, uh, but you see the Russian, it's not very kind. To, to see as a, in a way Russia has a really bad image already in 1915. You can see this. And Hindenburg is the man with the X. And he has a lot of multiple honors. He became honorary citizens, uh, uh, honorary doctorates uh, soon several weeks and months after the winning uh, of the battle. And even an icebreaker was named after him. And in 1915, one of the biggest cities of Upper Silesia is named to Hindenburg. He was, in 1915, already a superhero of the German military. As conclusion, here a nice picture of him, and he knows how to do this. He was very good at letting it photograph. And it's, alas, it's a German victory. The Battle of Tannenberg is a German victory. That's no question. And, but it happened not as a plan from A to B and uh, 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 leadership, uh, which is fully in command and fully capable, uh, full of knowledge of everything. There were a lot of, lot of problems and frictions during the Battle of Tannenberg. But in a way, it shows how professionalism saves a lot of people during a battle. And these officers were really professional military thinkers. It was the beginning of the First World War. They were educated over years. They had a lot of maneuvers. During the First World War, these people came to other posts. And uh, on the field, on these levels, were a lot of younger people, younger officers, reserve officers. But this was the first day of battle. And for this, they, they, they trained for years, let's say. And uh, Barbara Tuckman, who wrote this famous book, Guns of August, he said, okay, this is the savior Hindenburg. And he was transformed by this victory. And uh, he became the mythical leader of Germany, even through the war. And in the end, he became twice elected president of Germany during the Weimar Republic. And I think he is the first and only head of state in Germany, which is elected directly by the German people. This was never before and never afterwards. He's the only one in German history. But he take also he became his really big memorial. This was built in the end of the 1920s. They built a large memorial uh, for the Tannenberg battle and uh, after his death, Hindenburg and his wife were buried here in this memorial. It became a national monument, and it was a super grave for Hindenburg. So even after his death, he was a kind of uh, yeah, mythical hero of the German people. But this was also propaganda, but now not for Hindenburg. It was for Hitler. He took him as propaganda, and he used Hindenburg's image to... Uh, yeah, to take over what Hindenburg had as his charismatic leadership a little bit. Hitler tried to become uh, not the Reich's president, but he, he mixed this office of Reich's president and chancellor. So 
So today, Hindenburg and Ludendorff in Germany are really bad and poor role models for democracy because 1923, Ludendorff tried the beer hall putsch in Munich a hundred years from now. And in 1933, Hindenburg made Hitler Reich Chancellor and uh, helped him to, uh, with a signature for the first months of uh, Hitler's reign, helped Hitler to destroy the German democracy in a way. And this is uh, what today led to the fact that both in Germany are normally forgotten or are watched with rather distance. So, gracias a todos. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you very much for your incredible presentation. A complete topic for all our audience. Thank you very much. So during the presentation, we received uh, several questions in the chat from the audience. So I would like to hand over to David to get your start with some questions from the public. So David, ¿qué te parece si iniciamos con las preguntas? Sí, muchas gracias, Laura. Eh, pues sí, tenemos algunas preguntas que nos han enviado los alumnos, por lo cual vamos a realizar la primera de ellas. Dice, sí, la batalla es particularmente notable, la batalla de Tannenberg, por los rápidos movimientos ferroviarios del octavo ejército alemán, lo que les permitió eh, concentrarse con cada uno de los dos ejércitos rusos por turno, primero retrasando al primer ejército y luego destruyendo al segundo antes de volver a atacar al primero, días después. Eh, la pregunta sería, ¿crees que por el hecho de que los rusos no codificaron sus mensajes de radio transmitiendo sus órdenes de marcha diarias en claro lo que permitió a los alemanes realizar sus movimientos con la confianza de que no serían flanqueados? Okay, the first question for the colonel is about the battle is particularly uh, notable for the rapid rail movement of the German Eighth Army, which allowed them to concentrate against each of the two Russian armies in turn. First, delay the first army and then destroy the second army, army before returning to attack the first army days later. Do you think because the Russians did not scramble the radio messages transmitting their daily machine orders in clear, which allow the Germans to make their moves in confidence that they would not be active? Outflank. Yes, this is this is if the question. This is in a way it's true, but in a way I think not. This is so difficult because they had this radio uh, reconnaissance or this uh, reception of this, and uh, but this information was not at hand for everyone who needed this information, even on the German side. But uh, it's in a puzzle when you see reconnaissance. It's a puzzle of everything. So it fitted very well to what the Germans saw uh, from the Rennenkampf front, that they were not moving. They were not moving. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's one cause, but not the main cause. It's like in a puzzle. It's one piece. And uh, when you see the generals, in a way, who are division commanders in the field during the Battle of Tannenberg, they are sometimes don't know they don't know about this uh, this uh, movement of the russians they are interested in an area for example 30 40 kilometers and uh, and they are interested in what what will happen tomorrow because they they know what they can march in a day and they know in a way around what can be dangerous for me in a day's march And so it's, uh, I think for the high command, it may be a little bit calming, but for the commanders in the field, it was sometimes not so important to know this. And uh, they decided on their level what they knew with their forces. And they, so I think this would be perhaps this information. And, and uh, the deciphering, for example, uh, it was typical, uh, even the Germans at the Western Front 
a lot of officers forgot their deciphering their information. They forgot this in the headquarters when they started to leave for the Western Front. And the Signal Corps, in, uh, even in the West, it was not so good, uh, it was not so good working uh, like people uh, would expect. And, uh, but it was, um, it, uh, for example, when you compare it to the Second World War, uh, the, the, the German army developed uh, these ideas of, of their Signal Corps capabilities, knowing that in the First World War, these capabilities uh, wasn't only uh, was, was was on low level low level uh, low level capabilities. So people like uh, General Felgiebel or even General Guderian, who was in the First World War signal officer, who commanded a signal uh, a signal post, they knew that they could do better after 1914. Uh, 1914 uh, signals in the West and in the East uh, were in the German side, not uh, very much developed, like in, in in the Second World War, for example. And for the Russians, they had a lot of radio stations on rather new level. But um, as it was, the when you have only one station, and you you miss uh, miss your people, or you, you have distributed your forces in the woods between lakes. There, you need one with a with a horse or with a with a car to drive and to tell them, because uh, there's normally for a division or for a brigade they have a big, big radio station, not more. No? Thank you, thank you, very good answer. Y vamos con una segunda pregunta. La siguiente pregunta que nos han enviado los alumnos es la siguiente. Dice así. Eh, ¿Crees que podemos considerar la batalla de Tannenberg como la mayor derrota sufrida por cualquiera de los combatientes durante la Primera Guerra Mundial? ¿La podemos considerar como una obra maestra táctica que demostraría las habilidades superiores del ejército alemán? Ok, la next question that have some of our students is about do you think we can consider the battle of Tannenberg as the great defeat? suffer by any of the combatants during the war and can we consider it as a tactical masterpiece that would demonstrate the superior abilities of the german army yeah as it's a really big loss also uh, destroying a whole army is a real big loss i told you it's a real it's a victory in the end and but a tactical masterpiece there are tech maybe it is a tactical on tactical level but uh, the, the whole war was one tactical masterpiece after another. The question was here, is it an operational masterpiece or strategic? Not it's strategic, it's a kind of defeat because in the West, the Germans can't uh, reach Paris. So when you see it on a strategic level, it may be a, a defeat uh, overall, but on an operational level, it's a real big victory. Uh, but... Um, um, it is the biggest victory, I think. Yes, in a way, I think so. From for me, I would say, okay, it's a really big victory. Perhaps it's the biggest victory in this way. But I would like, uh, perhaps, um, I like also the Golitzatano, uh, Golitzatano operation, which is also very interesting to focus on. Uh, it's uh, far more south, but it's also a really big, uh, big uh, operational uh, uh, success. And um, yes, but it's it's rare to find a a kind of uh, yeah, single uh, single standing victory like this, because it's it looks so uh, yeah it looks really yeah as, as a as a monument of itself a little bit. And even if you look on the map today, it's it's uh, it's not so easy to understand. But you see something is moving. It's only one army against two armies. This is not normal at the Western Front in this way. No? They are, then they are, come uh, on, they they are standing next to each other. Even at the the front, uh, Austrian Hungarian front against Russia, it's uh, it's this uh, uh, this uh, army next to army. But in this area, at the beginning of the war, a freely operating army in the field. 
against two armies also in a way freely operating. This maybe is unique in a way, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Really good answer. And we continue with another question. Eh, ¿Qué te parece, eh, David, si continuamos con una última pregunta para continuar con nuestra programación? La última pregunta que nos envían los alumnos es la siguiente. Eh, la batalla fue un desastre total para el ejército imperial ruso. Se perdieron tres cuerpos de ejército de 170.000 bajas, entre muertos, heridos y capturados. ¿Crees que el ejército del zar estaba mal organizado, quizá mal dirigido, o la falta de la moral y de la logística militar fueron las causantes de esta debacle rusa en la batalla de Tánima? Ok, the last question is about uh, the battle was a total disaster for the Russian Imperial Army. Three army corps were lost, uh, 170,000 casualties among dead, wounded, and, and captured. Do you think that the Tsar's army was poorly organized, perhaps poorly led, or the lacks of moral and military logistics were the cause of this Russian debacle? No. This is also, I think it's a difficult question. So normally, I should say they're the best in the world because the Germans won the, won the battle. <laughs> But uh, I think they they lost the Russo-Japanese war several years ago. And uh, they uh, there is this, uh, this idea of uh, yeah, perhaps uh, to, to against the war. I think their war was the war against Austro-Hungary. And when you see what uh, the, the First World War developed over the years, the Russians, they, they had a front, they were operating at a front, and the Austrians had a lot of problems. And uh, I once uh, uh, worked on the Brusilov Offensive, and the Brusilov Offensive is incredibly uh, incredible success, and it was a real, uh, real difference. And you can, they, he did it, With the Russian army uh, for years fighting at the Eastern Front, but he he it was he could, can make it as a general, and this was not a one man show. And so they were, in a way, good soldiers, and they had a lot of soldiers. And what uh, what was they lost a lot of soldiers during this war, but they had still a lot of soldiers. But Russia, it's this steam, uh, it's like the, the image. It's it's a real big army. And uh, uh, they they were used to to yeah, it's, it's their country. The war took place in Russia for the rest of the war, and they hold out for a very long time. And the officers, I think, perhaps they were not so good as the Germans. I think they were good professional officers also. Yeah? And uh, in the end, um, and this was perhaps they they didn't believe in themselves. They You can. I, I presented you this uh, the sentence of one officer, and uh, this. The, there are several works on this Russian Stavka, how the Stavka worked, and this is also interesting. It's and what's also good that the Stavka was sometimes forced by the Allied. The Allied forces said, "Okay, the Russians had to do anything." So and the Russians did this. I think they did their job in this alliance. And in the end, they lost the war against Germany in 1970 and 1918. They lost the war on the Eastern Front. But up to this, they they gave a lot of release to the armies in the West. And so in, as an ally, they did their job. So it's like this. I think so. No? Excellent. And excellent as well, Lieutenant Colonel. Thank you very much for providing such a great presentation to the audience. Really, thank you very much. Thank you. So I would like to give the floor to David to give a brief summary of what we've seen in the presentation. Eh, David, te cedo la palabra para, ir, para iniciar con un breve resumen de lo que vimos hoy con el coronel. Estás en, en mute. <laughs> sí, disculpa, ahora, ahora estoy ya de nuevo con el micro puesto. Eh, simplemente agradecer al teniente coronel Heiner Brockerman, subdirector del Departamento de Educación del Centro de Historia Militar y Ciencias Sociales del Bundeswehr, 
en Potsdam su participación en este seminario sobre la Primera Guerra Mundial y sobre todo felicitarle por esa magnífica ponencia sobre Hindenburg Ludendorff en la batalla de Tannenberg en 1914. Tal y como nos ha ido detallando el, el coronel Brockerman, eh, la batalla resultó realmente en la destrucción casi completa del segundo ejército ruso y el suicidio de su comandante general, Alexander Samsonov. Eh, una serie de batallas posteriores también destruyeron a la mayor parte del primer ejército y mantuvieron a los rusos desequilibrados hasta la primera de 1915, como muy bien nos ha ido explicando durante toda la conferencia. La batalla es particularmente notable por los rápidos movimientos ferroviarios del octavo ejército alemán, lo que les va a permitir esa concentración contra cada uno de los dos ejércitos rusos por turno, primero retrasando al primer ejército y luego destruyendo al segundo antes de volver a atacar al primero días después. También es notable por el hecho de que los rusos no codificaron sus mensajes de radio, transmitiendo sus órdenes de, de marcha diarias, eh, lo que permitió pues, a los alemanes quizá realizar esos movimientos con la confianza de que no serían franqueados. Tannenberg, como muy bien nos ha explicado el teniente coronel Brockerman, fue la, la mayor derrota sufrida eh, por cualquiera de los combatientes durante la guerra. Fue una obra maestra táctica que demostró las habilidades superiores del ejército alemán. Su organización y entrenamiento de antes de la guerra que habían demostrado su eficacia, lo que reforzó la moral alemana al tiempo que también sacudía gravemente la confianza rusa. Thank you very much, Heiner, for this excellent lecture and the great answers uh, to our students. Thank you. Thank you. So we want to say welcome to all participants, attendees, and speakers who were present in, on the third day of the seminar on the World War I. Without a doubt, they have been an interesting presentation. And remember that tomorrow we continue with our last day of the event and many interesting topics on this seminar. So thank you very much and see you tomorrow with more of this event. See you. Thank you.